Good evening. I'd like to call to order this regularly scheduled meeting for the City Council of the City of Calistoga. It is Tuesday, November 19th at exactly 6 p.m. City Clerk, has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes. Thank you. Can we have roll call, please? Council Member Williams. Present. Council Member Lopez Ortega. Here. Council Member Kraus. Here. Vice Mayor Dunsford. Here. Mayor Canning. Here. Thank you. If you have not already done so, please either switch your phones to silent mode or turn them off. And then if you are able, please stand and join for a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So good evening again and welcome to another eve of yet one more PSPS for the uh, city of Calistoga. I know that's why we're all excited to be here. So we'll get this over before 7 a.m. Uh, so you'll have time to go home and charge your cell phones for those of us that live on the other side of the river, not the wrong side of the river. Um, we'll now open oral communication on consent items or non-agendized items. This time is set aside to receive comments from the public regarding matters on the consent calendar or matters of municipal concern not on the agenda. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.3, also known as the Brown Act. However, the Council cannot consider any issues or take action on any request during this comment period. Speakers are encouraged to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes uh, so that all speakers have an opportunity to address the City Council. And as a polite reminder, we do not allow for the allotment of one speaker's time to another. With that, I have one speaker card under public comment. Zach, if you would. Should you so choose, share with us your name, address, and if it applies, the organization you represent. Great. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Zach Guzik, uh, 1316 Berry Street here in Calistoga, Unit C. Uh, I, I'm here as a citizen, but also on behalf of the Family Center tonight. Um, we have an event coming up on Thursday evening that we're partnering with the city and the County Office of Public Health. Um, we're hosting a community conversation at Calistoga High School Thursday evening at 6 p.m. where we're discussing the topic of social inclusion. And I felt like with this week also being a city council meeting, I'd be remiss if I didn't make this public to everybody so that they would come out and join us. Um, the event will be from 6 to 8 in the evening, and we'll be asking the community to come and share um, both celebrations and concerns that they have around the topic of inclusion and what that means to them in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Zach. You. Appreciate the work you guys do for us. I have no other speaker cards. Is anyone else wishing to address the council on a consent calendar item or a non agendized item? Not seeing any movement forward, I will entertain a motion, I'll close oral communication, excuse me, and entertain a motion to adopt this evening's agenda unless a modification is requested. I move we adopt. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Williams, a second by Council Member Krause. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Council requests and ideas for discussion. Council Member Lopez Ortega. Uh, yes, well, I was about to mention also the uh, meeting that, uh, that we have with the Family Center. But regarding tomorrow uh, with the PSPS, I uh, just want to, uh, you know, ask the community to be aware of your neighbors, especially if they are elderly people that they need assistance, uh, to reach out to them and see, um, you know, be sure they're safe. And is anything that uh, we need to do, can you please let us know if anybody needs help? That's it. Thank you very much. Council Member Williams. Uh, not quite council business, but I just want to uh, draw attention to the uh, loveliness of the leaves, the falling leaves in the fall here. Just a gorgeous uh, time of year, and I just want to uh, express our appreciation for that. Unless you work for Public Works and you have to clean all those <laughs> leaves up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even, even then. Even then. Thank you very much. Council Member Krause. Yes, uh, two things. Besides it being a PSPS tomorrow, it's also red flag. So... Uh, uh, be mindful uh, about fire safety. The other thing that uh, I'd like to bring up for uh, staff uh, to consider is I have received a single complaint about uh, neighbors running 
generators during uh, PSPS. I forwarded that. Uh, it was an email complaint. I forwarded it on off to the uh, city manager and the planning department. Um, so I, I don't know if there's anything within a current city ordinances that would regulate uh, that kind of thing as far as whether it's being done safely. Um, uh, the concern was about noise. Um, I, I have some sympathy on both sides. One, you do need to have power, and two, it does um, uh, create a problem uh, for the neighbors. So um, if we can look into how it is, or if there's something that, that we can do to perhaps head off a problem there, I'd appreciate it. If I could take uh, advantage of the situation that we have Brad Cannon here, building official, if you can give us a quick summary or what is required of someone operating a generator. Um, well, I sure. know there are a couple different kinds. But. Sure. Um, we've, uh, as you probably already know, we've had quite the run on uh, generator permits. Um, so typically uh, we do, if they're permanent, we do require a permit. So those are hooked to uh, your electric service through a switch gear transfer switch um, and then uh, natural gas or propane um, portable generators those are not permitted so those have uh, not required thank you very much um, so it's not required for for portable generators um, so you'll see that those are you know through extension cords those are run into your to your home to, to back up uh, refrigerators or whatnot um, we've required uh, a few of the permitted permanent generators to have sound walls um, it makes sense especially in the mobile home parks uh, we found that that was um, a way that we could uh, prevent you know complaints um, so those are working um, and yeah I think it's it's just something that we probably should look at a little closer uh, with the the portable generators is there a decibel max uh, that if you had a temporary generator you have to adhere to if a complaint was mm, filed no not 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 right now okay chief if Campbell could, if I could just add to that if anybody has any concern of improper use of portable generators give us a call uh, either a complainant or an owner we'd be happy to go out and make sure that it's it's running safe and it's far enough away from windows and uh, not creating a fire hazard or a CO poisoning issue. Well, as a note, yeah, we did put out a, a, a PSA for uh, safety requirements for that. That's on our website for portable generators. And based on an incident in my neighborhood, I would suggest that if you're displeased with the sound of your neighbor's generator, that you talk to them first versus shutting it off on them in the middle of the night unbeknownst to them because then it ends up in a whole entirely different conversation <laughs> uh vice mayor dunsford nothing today all right i have a couple of things uh again along the lines of the red flag and the psps be prepared be safe check on your neighbors um, and as a reminder which came up during our net our last council meeting your primary source of information for all things related to public safety in calistoga is the calistoga issued nixel alerts as well as the county issued nixle alerts a reliable source of information as to whether or not the town evacuates or isn't a psps or not is not nextdoor.com or facebook okay so if you haven't heard it on nixel from the county of napa or the city of calistoga um, don't necessarily consider it the be all and the end all and if at any point you have any doubts or any questions or concern please feel free to call the police dispatch on the non-emergency number at 942-2810 or if you have an emergency obviously 911 so thank you very much on that um, couple of announcements in addition um, Virginia Dooley a longtime resident of Calistoga has just celebrated her 100th birthday um, so there was quite a little gathering for her. So if you see her around town and she still gets out and about, be sure to say happy birthday to her. And then also celebrating 100 years um, is the Mount View Hotel and Spa. They're just coming up with their 100th anniversary. Um, it is a historic landmark hotel inside of the United States. Great property. 
um, and the current owners have done, the Woods have done an amazing job in its renovations and upkeep, um, and it's become quite the destination here in Calistoga. So, um, not that I would strong arm the 100-year-old hotel, but, you know, maybe g buying a drink for the 100-year-old person would be a nice way to kick off that party, but we'll go from there. Um, with that said, we'll move on to the city manager's report. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Mike Kern, city manager. Uh, just a couple of issues. Um, the community survey is now live, um, so it's available for folks to start filling out. Uh, that went live yesterday. Um, you can find that by visiting our website. Uh, it's both in English and Spanish. Paper copies are available at City Hall for those that would, not, would prefer not to do it online. We are printing out postcards that will go into the mail uh, to remind people. There, we'll also have a link um, being uh, broadcast on Channel 28 to advise people of that as well. Uh, the survey will be open through December 6th, so we would encourage folks to, if they're so inclined, to fill out that survey. We'll also have some notices to hand out at the community meeting uh, this Thursday as well. So. That's off to Zach for getting that wrapped up. With regard to the PSPS, uh, I just want to remind folks, safety is our number one priority, so please be careful. Uh, PG&E is planning on running the generators at the substation, so the east side of the community will be energized. Uh, there will be a lead lag time from when they go dark and when they get those fired up. They're getting better at it, unfortunately, but they are. Um, PG&E will have a community resource center at the fairgrounds. However, this time it will be located near the, the golf course next to the pro shop and not by the Great Lawn. And we expect the hours of operation to be from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And depending on how quickly they're able to restore, um, they may also operate that uh, on Thursday. Um, all departments are ready uh, for the event. Uh, police and fire have extra staffing. They will be conducting uh, community patrols and wellness checks during the, the event. Uh, Public Works has um, on-call and after-hour staff uh, to operate the facilities, the plants, and the um, lift stations. Um, I think the only other thing that I want to add is the governor um, put forward a, a block of money uh, for PSPS grant applications. Um, the city uh, applied for a grant um, the project that we selected was to was installing a emergency generator at uh, Rancho D and so hopefully if we're successful in that we put in for uh, half a million dollars uh, unknown if we'll get it but it was an opportunity and we felt that was a, an appropriate place to look for some money so keep our fingers crossed and hopefully we'll get that and with that that's all I have to add this evening and just on that note to um, set expectations it's a grant being applied for by many different cities so far from a done deal so don't let the uh, expectation be that we're building one of these out very soon for that community I I appreciate that but uh, we want to make sure that they know what that means all right <clears throat> uh, with that said we'll move on to proclamations presentations and awards and first up chief Salaya Introduction of newly promoted police corporals, corporals Nicholas Delia and Christine Romo, and then you'll be introducing a new dispatcher, Wendy Ramirez Munoz. Chief, all yours. I am. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, City Manager Kern, and Acting uh, City Clerk Velasquez. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, it's my pleasure to announce a couple new, uh, well, maybe not new individuals to the police department, but new roles that they'll be fulfilling. And I'd like to start off with our uh, dispatch center. So uh, recently we had an a dispatcher uh, move on to another agency, which left an opening. We did an internal recruitment, and I'm happy to say that we selected an outstanding candidate. Now, if I can have police dispatcher Wendy Ramirez Munoz come up to the podium. So the, dis so the police department is a 24-7 operation, and part of the police department, there's a dispatch center. And without a doubt, the police department could not do any of its job, its functions, provide services without our dispatch center. It's a 24-hour dispatch center that's, that's operated by four full-time dispatchers and anywhere from two to three uh, part-time dispatchers. 
Uh, we hired Wendy, I think, straight out of the Dispatch Academy in 2017. She's been with us for about two years. And so uh, we had the opportunity through an internal recruitment to, uh, uh, to hire Wendy as our full-time dispatcher. And uh, I just want to say a little bit of words about her. Um, Wendy is just an amazing individual. Uh, she, uh, besides having such a positive, enthusiastic attitude, she's always smiling, uh, uh, reliable, dependable. We count our, on our part-time dispatchers that when we have vacancies, sometimes spontaneously, sometimes planned, we call our part-time dispatchers to come in. And I will say, I don't think I can recall a time that Wendy did not respond to our call and come in, you know, regardless of the, of the day or time. And so uh, she's just is quite the catch for us as far as being our full-time dispatcher. Um, and I would like to allow Wendy to say any words that she would like, but we're just thrilled to move her into a full-time dispatch position. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really glad I was given this opportunity and I look forward to you know, helping the community at a full-time level. Thank you. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to, uh, especially in the last several PSPSs, to spend some time in the dispatch center um, because that's where the Nixels get dispatched from. Uh, and I will have to say the volume of calls that they take, their level of professionalism, care, compassion, um, and patience um, is pretty incredible. Uh, and just in the relatively short amount of time I've spent there, I suggested that they start keeping a list so they can write a book of some of the more interesting questions they get. Uh, but uh, you, you and I went through a whole series of Nixles together, and uh, thank you very much for your service, and thank your colleagues that work very hard over there taking care of our community on the other end of the phone, uh, which makes them feel safe and uh, looked after. So thank you. And to make mention that, you know, we Wendy brings uh, many skill sets, and besides being bilingual, her, her attitude and demeanor and how she approaches things is just, is just such a great fit for us. So, and for those of you that have come to the front counter, our dispatchers, they do everything. They dispatch the officers, they answer the 911 calls, they answer the business lines, they're the front counter person, they're the records person. They're everything and everything to, in our department. So uh, she's a great catch for us. And I'd like to move on to the corporals. So a few months ago, you allowed me the opportunity to, uh, to create a corporal specialty position. It was a means to develop a, uh, a succession plan for the department and allow officers to move into a quasi-supervisor position in the form of a corporal. And so we did an internal selection process. We identified two individuals, and I'd like to call them back up. And one would be Officer Nick, Nicholas Delia and Officer Christine Romo. So the larger individual behind me, <laughs> Officer Delia, uh, he's, he's been with us for, for a little over, uh, little over uh, three and a half years. Uh, quite the individual. He's worked both shifts, day shift and night shift. Uh, he is uh, one of our range instructors. He was Officer of the Year last year, and he's quite the up-and-comer for our organization. And he's gr a great representation for us and, uh, as far as his... Uh, professionalism, how he handles calls, his demeanor, even though he's larger than life, uh, he's, he's quite approachable and very well uh, liked, not only amongst his peers, but when I talk to community members, they have always have positive things to say about their interactions with Nick. So I'd like to introduce Nick. Our second um, corporal position, is our senior officer, our most senior officer on the force. That would be Officer Christine Romo. I think everybody knows Christine. Uh, we kid with her that if they don't know her, she's, they're related to her, she's related to them. Uh, she is our senior officer. She's our field training officer. She's our a property and evidence officer. She was also officer of the year in 2017. Uh, amongst another thing, she had a couple life-saving awards that she's been honored with. She has quite the distinct uh, uh, history here with our organization. And uh, her demeanor is, is without question, besides the smile on her face and how she interacts with the individual, everyone that I come into contact that has had interaction with Christine always has positive comments about her. And her experience and skill set 
is within our organization is just something uh, that uh, we we couldn't replace that we can't uh, uh, well we can't replace so I'd like to introduce Christine and uh, offer them an opportunity to say something if they'd like <laughs> well I, I think I speak for Officer Romo and myself when I say we're excited about this opportunity um, it's great that you know, we kind of get the chance to help uh, help our department grow in the form of becoming corporals. And um, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I th thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're on the hook for buying her the first lunch because you just referred to Corporal Romo as Officer Romo. No, that's it? That's it. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> and Nick is the only officer in our department that's not allowed to stand next to me ever. <laughs> My driver's license says I'm 5'8", but that's... <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. All right, from one chief to the next, Chief Campbell, we have the oath of office and swearing in of Firefighter Nash Fields. Thank you. Come on up, Nash. As he's working his way up, his uh, mom, Char, is going to pin him. Nash uh, was a senior just a few short months ago, so he's our youngest uh, candidate we've had in a long time. He uh, picked Calistoga as a senior project, did a lot of ride-alongs with us. He fed in. Uh, we talked him into, I don't think we had to talk too much to him. I think he was pretty interested in joining the force. He had to go through the same process that we always have. Physical agility is always first. Uh, he was number one in his group of people, 15. Uh, Ten of them failed. And out of that whole group, we ended up with uh, one person. So we're excited to have him on. He's uh, a good guy. Uh, he's smart. He's uh, cramming right now for EMT finals, and uh, we're trying to work him to death in between. So uh, with that said, let me get this. All right, now you need your oath. The badge is only half the battle. Break it up. I know your new colleagues got that on video, right guys? <laughs> so while Nash is signing, Nash got to sit through our first, on his second day or first day, the last PSPS that we went through, long haul. Um, so thank you for, uh, 
for working so quickly with us. Welcome to the podium. And I also want to uh, take this opportunity to thank your family for sharing you with us uh, in serving our community. Thank you very much. And you are uh, joining a fantastic crew back there. Um, in, in all seriousness, you're joining an incredible group of uh, people, professional, um, excellent at what they do, uh, and do that every day, selflessly and with a great attitude. Um, so uh, you have big shoes to fill over there, but you will bring the average age down and the average intelligence up, I'm sure. So let's just go from there. I, I need to remind the mayor that they're boots, not shoes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Nash, anything to share with us? Uh, I'd just like to thank the, uh, the city and the fire department for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, I'm very grateful and um, I'm honored to be able to serve the needs of the city. Um, I'd also like to thank my family for always supporting me and uh, pushing me and helping me get to where I am today. Thank you very much. Welcome. All right, we'll give the room a second to clear. How are you staying for the whole thing? <laughs> Thank you guys, thanks for keeping us safe on both sides. All right, we will move on. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent calendar as presented unless anyone needs to pull an item. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Dunsford, a second by Councilmember Lopez Ortega. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item I, number four, public hearing. Introduction of an ordinance repealing certain chapters of Calistoga Municipal Code, Title 15, Building Standards Codes, and adopting the 2019 California Building Standards Codes, Title 24, with local amendments in the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code. The recommended action this evening is consider introducing, introducing the ordinance and waiving its first reading. Taking us through this today will be building official Brad Cannon. Brad, welcome back. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Appreciate you having us here. Steve and uh, myself uh, looked into this item. Um, it's every three years. We get to do the code adoption dance. And um, so this year with the 2019 California Building Standards Code, with our local amendments, we are adopting, I wanted to point out, we are adopting the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code. And that is a little thinner than the other ones, but I'd like to pass that around. This is a good tool that um, our code enforcement uh, division is going to be able to use. Um, it's got a little bit more teeth, a little more technical, and uh, it's something that uh, will help uh, with our code enforcement cases. Uh, so the background, you, you adopted the 2016 codes um, back in November 2016. So that with the 2019 building standards codes, we, we you'll see changes between those code cycles. Um, what we've tried to do this year with our Napa uh, County building official group, we've put these lovely little brochures together for you. And I've got 20, only 20, on the back table if anybody would like to take for their reading enjoyment. Um, but it summarizes basically, you know, the, the, the significant code changes. It doesn't hit them all, but uh, it's, uh, it's important to get those out to our uh, designers, our engineers, our architects, um, our contractors. And so our group is actually putting together on December 10th down in Yonville an outreach, four to six. Um, so um, we want to try to get the word out and, and, and um, share the code changes from 2016 to 2019. One of the things that we also did this year um, with our code adoption is uh, per the government code section 65850.7 uh, was requiring cities to establish procedures for expedited streamlined processes for permitting of electric vehicle charging stations. And so we did, uh, 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 um, we basically took Sonoma County's template and we adopted that and put that together. And that is actually online at our, in our online permitting portal. And so um, once we uh, adopt that, we'll be in line with this government code section. 
Um, so the analysis of, of our local amendments is that those amendments from 2016 that we adopted are, are still in place. And we're essentially um, bringing those forward, uh, recommending for those to be brought forward. Um, and you have to make the case with your climactic or geographical and topographical conditions justify those for more restrictive code provisions. And that's how we, that's the process of, of uh, that we go through with uh, the Building Standards Commission. Um, so we did, uh, Steve and I did take this to the BizAB board back on uh, November 6th, and they do recommend its adoption to uh, you, the city council. There's not really any fiscal impact other than the code books cost a few bucks, but we have that in our budget. Um, we do want to bring permit fees. I mean, they were last updated in 2008, so I am working with a consultant to come back to you guys and, um, and look uh, for a more fair fee fee-for-service based model um, that'll update us because we haven't we haven't updated those in a while uh, no propose uh, the proposed ordinance is exempt from California Environmental Quality Act um, and we think it's uh, consistent with our city goals council goals and objectives goal number seven and you know, we're really um, trying to to make things safe the, the saying is you know when when nothing's happening you know we're doing a good job and so I think between um, planning and building and, and fire um, and our code enforcement you know we're, we're out there working behind the scenes to try to think make make the community safer um, so a priority project develop and adopt local fire codes that exceed county and state minimums as appropriate to protect life and property and I think you've seen that in our local amendments that we've already adopted and we're continuing to look at other things um, one one example uh, is uh, um, um, Steve brought to the table which was the um, fire sprinkler did you want to talk talk to that uh, the, sure. roof, the roof so we one of our uh, amendments to the fire sprinkler ordinance um, if somebody does a certain amount of remodel on a, a project of course any new construction requires sprinklers but any significant remodel so mm -hmm. We've uh, tweaked that a little bit and, and added one more uh, requirement on that. If a person removes a significant amount of the roof structure, not the roof covering, but the roof structure, uh, that would require fire sprinklers as well. So like, like a, a, a roof line change or um, s substantial you know, roof, roof repair. Um, so that's an example um, and so alternatively if the city doesn't adopt the new state codes uh, by January 1st 2020 the city would be required to apply them in their entirety without any of our local amendments so that's that's the current law for that so we recommend uh, considering the introducing of the ordinance and waiving the, its first reading and with that I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions Thank you very much and as mentioned this is primarily an administrative act to make sure that we are compliant with state and federal codes as well as any updates that we may see fit locally correct, correct. all right council members any questions regarding this item yeah I council member Krause. I do have a, a request for the uh, City Council uh, to consider um, some months back I became aware that we were going to be redoing the the codes and uh, I asked at that time uh, that uh, I have an opportunity to uh, put in some input on that uh, for whatever reason that didn't occur but um, uh, I can't help but be concerned about the city as I'm sure all of you are having been evacuated twice because of uh, the potential of a wildland fire spreading through the community there is a section of the code called uh, chapter 7a and it's in the building code and what that chapter do, does is it requires certain fire protection features be built into homes or buildings that are in a higher high fire hazard severity zone that is part of the code that uh, uh, is proposed when I look at what happened in Middletown, Lower Lake, the Tubbs fire, the Camp fire, and the Kincaid fire, these wildland fire, wild fires 
with wind conditions don't stay in the wildland for very long and they can run right through town. What the uh, 7A does is it requires uh, uh, certain fire resistive materials be used on roofs and on sidings that uh, gutters be equipped so that you don't get leaves in them. Um, there are some other requirements for the size of the mesh on the vents to be smaller so that uh, embers don't come into the uh, into the attic or the call, crawl space under uh, the house and it definitely it's going to cost a few dollars more when someone goes to build a house uh, but I would like to have that chapter made applicable to the entire city um, and I, I checked with uh, our attorney we can do that tonight uh, even though it isn't in the staff report by simply saying uh, we would like to add uh, the applicability of chapter 7a to the balance of the city and um, we can also uh, add a uh, another stipulation uh, in the climate section of our justification for making a code more strict and um, I have a suggested suggested fire history language that we could put in and also uh, a one sentence item that would be uh, chapter 7 a shall be amended to include all new construction this wouldn't require existing houses to start changing all that stuff it would be new construction uh, I would imagine that just like the sprinkler systems and new code revisions as you get further down the road uh, there will probably be uh, some retroactivity but at this point I think we need to get started on this climate change has happened fires are worse uh, we just it's of a great concern uh, to me so I'll pass these around so that the council members can see uh, exactly what it is there may be some uh, language change in this that's needed to make it fit within the language of uh, 7a uh, and in speaking with the uh, city attorney uh, they would be able to massage that to, to get it to fit into there so that would be my request that the City Council consider uh, making chapter 7a applicable to the entire city uh, not just the high severity area uh, I would also urge people to watch the front line uh, documentary fire in paradise it takes about an hour to go through it very interesting um, heartbreaking uh, but at the same time I don't know if I heard this statistic in that documentary or whether I read it someplace the houses in paradise that survived met this new code so um, you know to me uh, it's important that it uh, be considered and acted on okay thank you any other council members uh, I'd like to be supportive but can we see it in writing be and, and adopted at the next meeting we'll, we'll go through the public hearing here and then we'll yeah move from there yeah, um, what it would be is if you look at at what they have done in the uh, staff report mm -hmm. what they've said is is we amend you know section 902.4 D to read such and such and what we would do here what I'd, I'd like to do to keep this thing on track for the January 1st deadline is is that uh, the council approve the amendment and then the language would come out of the council's office attorney's office in time to for the second reading so um, but the the chapter itself is what I think only about four pages yeah, it's, it's about four pages and essentially does so we'll have it written up for us before the next meeting or at the next meeting we, and, then, we, and then if we don't like it we can change you can, it you can do it and if it. if uh, if you'd like I'm sure Brad could 
provide you with a copy of the of, of yeah. the whole code. So in that case, I'm okay with going ahead with that. Um, Brad, can you talk a little bit about what the differences would be in the construction when you apply the 7A standards? Well, essentially, it's non-combustible mm -hmm. building materials um, from... Well, it's limited combustible. Limited combustible. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. And, um, you know, there has been some, as Gary said, Councilman Krauska said, is that, um, is that uh, it will increase the cost of construction. I'm, I'm hearing 15 to 25 percent range oh. over in Fountain Grove area at this point. Um, and they're all being required to meet that standard? Absolutely. And it's tied to this particular chapter is tied to the high severity map. So if you're within that area, um, and those maps are, are they're, um, they're put out by CAL FIRE. Um, it's it's uh, public resource code section. We'll have to get that for you. But, um, but it, it's specific to that map. And so... I, I, I did have a conversation uh, um, with the city attorney's office today and, and you know that's my concern is how you amend this chapter 7a to uh, apply to a, a city to the full city and, and and when it's when it's tied to this this high severity map that's that's approved by you know this process um, but you know um, as far as the materials they're they're you know they're they're out there they're they're available um, builders are used to it um, especially over in Fountain Grove and Santa Rosa area um, they, they understand you know what what uh, what they need to do um, so it's 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 not a difficult process uh, I would just ask the question you know uh, would it just be Councilman Cross just for new construction for new construction only okay is this something that you support and do you think the like would there be opposition to this like from say the local contractors or is it just a cost issue I I, uh, I honestly think you know it's 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 another layer of uh, requirements I know that um, you know until you've done a uh, until you've built a home um, if you're not experienced with it you know it's it's a little bit more challenging I think the cost is always uh, an issue some would would look at um, the the risk uh, to rewards um, you know and and and, um, and and question it so uh, but I, I I personally I, I support um, I support doing what we can you know to, to prevent um, um, question or uh, your house catching fire I mean I, I think it's it's a great way to to, to approach it but um, yeah I think there's some 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 hurdles there is the fire severity map what does that look like relative to the tier one two three is downtown Cal is it the entire city limits 2.2 square miles not in this severity map look at Foothill Boulevard everything south that side is all high severity zone everything around Mount St. Helena Highway 128 back around down through that ridge that runs back to Napa is all high severity zone the main parts of Calistoga is not okay so uh, and the I'd, mobile homes wouldn't be included because they're they're regulated by the state so I have a question about what constitutes new construction so I'm, I'm looking at line 689 in our report and maybe you can tell me if it's applicable or not, but according to this definition, new construction is just about any work at all on a building, on a structure. And so, unless that's inapplicable somehow. Which section are you going to? My, my intent would be, line, this is line 689. So you're in the draft ordinance, uh, 689? So it says, for the purposes of this chapter, Wherever the phrase new construction is used in the fire code, it shall be defined as any work, including an addition, remodel, repair, renovation, or alteration of any building or structure. So that is a pretty broad application. And if it applies, if this new law applies, if the new code applies to any uh, new work, any new construction, then uh, that's a that's a big thing. Did you want to go ahead and ask? Councilman Williams, if I could. Um, sure. In our local amendments, you'll see it's uh, 
spells out what a new construction would be. So if somebody's to remodel their house, they're going to remodel a bathroom that wouldn't be considered new construction, be 50% of the, the structure, or if they remove 50% of the ceiling or all the sheetrock inside, uh, plumbing, all that, we would treat that building as a new building. So, you know, a minor, minor remodel would not trigger uh, these codes. But say a bathroom remodel, is that minor or? or? That, that would be minor, yeah. We're so, looking at something more substantial. You add 50% of, of square footage to the house. You add a second story, that sort of thing. So does our Calisoga code supersede this one that I'm looking at, 680, line 689, or how does that work? I don't see how does that work. Yes, our amendments, um, you know, they're approved by the state city attorney. They're usually more restrictive. In this case, it just defines that a little better. So our amendments are... Usually, this we can't go below the state minimum, but we can act, make it more restrictive. So, it sounds like we're less restrictive if we're, I mean, this says any work is defined as new construction. Yeah, we're going to have to probably uh, look at that and maybe change that wording. And I'd, I'd be willing to... Uh, change the wording in the amendment to say something that applies to a new home or a new building of of some kind and not just if you're replacing the roof uh, I mean to me that's uh it's expensive I just did it but uh, 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 to me that's that's not new construction it's it's the old house it's you know. we, we already have definitions because that triggers different elements of our code to begin with so right. those are those already it, something that triggers whether it's not whether it's considered a renovation or yeah exactly okay. and I'd, I'd like to point out uh, councilman Williams is in the building code newly constructed is a building that has never been used or occupied for any purpose mm -hmm. so essentially I think that's the that's the, the definition to define. It, it isn't the first time that there's a conflict of definitions between one code and another. Mm. And since this amendment is in the building code, not in the fire code, um, that would be the yeah. definition that would be used of new construction. Yeah, I would agree with that. So my concern, obviously, not opposed to making things safer, but we this confronts another challenge we have, which is housing that's affordable and building housing that's affordable in Calistoga. Um, and 15 to 25% premium to get to a standard that the state's not requiring, while yes, you should always want to build safer, the last thing we need to be doing in our housing market is increasing the cost of that housing. And this would also, I would imagine, Brad would apply to accessory dwelling units, correct? Then, if we were to take Chapter 7A and an accessory dwelling unit, by its de yes. de definition, is new construction. Yes. The purpose of an accessory dwelling unit is to achieve housing that's affordable in space inside of the city limits where there's more density. Um, that's the that's the challenge and concern I have. Is you're taking the cost of construction in an, in an already very expensive market up. I mean, I, I appreciate why we want would want to take this across but the unintended consequences do we now make it even less approachable to be able to but, but at the same time as you increase density you increase the possibility of structure to structure communication of fire understood it's you know the, this is um it's a little bit unclear to me there were many places where adus were accepted you know there would be rules stated or and then exceptions included ADUs um, and how it's not clear how is a building code different from a fire code and how is it that I mean how is somebody out there you know a contractor or a homeowner how are they supposed to know that one supersedes the other you know well the, the codes very clear on okay. on what supersedes I mean but typically the building code is for new construction um, and the fire code is for existing structures so it's it's life and safety for for existing structures Do you want to add anything to that yeah that's a good point that you make, of course, as to pushing up the cost of building. Could you summarize the changes 
uh, regarding the sprinklers. You touched on it. And so which, what will trigger the requirement to install sprinklers? Um, any new building built in Calistoga would require fire sprinklers. Any new building of any kind? Any kind. And that's a state requirement, correct? Correct. With the exception <coughs> of mobile homes. They fall under a different code. They're regulated by the state. It's not required in mobile homes or manufactured homes. And then if a build, excuse me, then nope. if a building is remodeled to more than 50% of it is remodeled, does that also trigger the requirement for sprinklers? That would trigger it, yes. Or if you remove more than 50% of the ceiling, that would trigger it. Or if you get the whole insides, take all the sheetrock or lath and plaster, whatever, whatever's on your walls, you take all that down, that would trigger it as well. And with our new code, we're, we're saying if you need major roof repair as well, not the, the sheeting, but the, you know, the joists and the, all the wood under there, if you have to structural 50% or more of the roof, you would, it would require fire sprinklers as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of the council? It is a public hearing, so I'll open it to the public in a moment. All right. Is there anyone in the public? I don't have any speaker cards, so I'd like to address this matter. All right. So we'll bring it back to the closed public comment, bring it back to the council for consideration. Um, I <clears throat> I appreciate the 7A, consideration of 7A across all buildings in Calistoga. My concern is what kind of cost impact and does that become so cost prohibitive that we've now kind of taken another ding at building housing in the community, especially when we talk about we need to get to larger structures, higher densities, you know, 51 units out on Grant. I mean, what would... Uh, 15% on top of that, even on the low end, is on a project they can't make work right now, becomes, in my opinion, an unintended consequence that makes it even more complicated. Do we know of any other cities, Gary, that have taken 7A? I believe in Santa Rosa there was uh, consideration of putting 7A into Coffee Park. And, um, and in the county, putting it uh, uh, requiring it in uh, Park West Springs, that neighborhood that burnt through there. Um, I did not see anything in the newspaper that they adopted uh, it for that standard for uh, this code revision. I'm not sure, sure that they didn't, but it, the, mm -hmm. the paper didn't say. Um, I, I can remember when uh, we went for sprinkler systems in homes and there was uh, a concern about uh, having uh, home and building construction costs uh, become prohibitive. Uh, but when you look at the benefits of sprinkler systems uh, and its impact upon the community as far as requirements for fire suppression, which uh, is a recurring cost, uh, certainly uh, uh, reducing the possibility of spread from building to building. And the way these fires spread when they come into town isn't in a wall of fire that comes into town. It's dozens and dozens of little spot fires. And that's what this code uh, addresses is to keep a spot fire uh, from spreading into the building or for from getting embers into the building from a spot fire uh, so um, I'm not unsympathetic to uh, the cost of, of construction uh, but like I said I think uh, when you read the statistics about paradise and uh, look at the buildings that did survive there uh, everybody's driven down uh, Mark West Springs Road over the last couple of years and seen the slow pace of rebuilding there. So um, uh, that's what motivates me. So, Gary, do you know if the insurance companies have caught up with uh, uh, the enhanced building codes, for example, a house that employs these kinds of safer um, you know, methods? You know, might well be entitled to a discount on the insurance, but I don't know. I, I do not know. If that's happened. I, I, I do not know that. I do know that they allow a discount for a home that has a sprinkler system in it. I don't know how great of a discount that is. Um, 
Uh, I just had a, a question. Um, will this code uh, can be modified to uh, the extent that it will be applied only to high density housing, like you know, like a hundred houses together or more, uh, and then for a single family home, uh, because my concern is about uh, uh, cost. You know, we need affordable housing in Calistoga, and then if we discourage investors uh, or, uh, I mean, small investors to, to build more housing, um, so is any way that it can be modified? Uh, absolutely, yeah. You can you can write your uh, amendment, you know, however you want it to, to work for your community, um, as long as you can tie it to one of those three conditions. And I think that you know, if if if, if you if you want to to point to certain high density communities, then you would you would um, you would write it that way. Um, but yeah, you can you can craft it any way. My comment to that is that the higher density projects are the affordable housing projects. So they're the ones that would be perhaps impacted the most in terms of the increased cost. But um, my concern is uh, I'm all for saving structures. Um, my, my concern is that this is being revealed tonight and perhaps there's other people in the community who thought this was going to be um, you know, perhaps, and I'm just thinking of the contractors or perhaps somebody else that might have opinions about this. I want to give them a chance. I, I don't know if this is, a, you know, it seems significant to me. This seems like a significant change. And I just don't want to, um, you know, make a significant change without ensuring that everybody has had a chance to provide comment. And, you know, I've heard from contractors Many times over the, the years, they, they oftentimes have complaints about code requirements. And uh, of course, public safety should be first and we need to do what's in the best interest of our town. But I think it's fair to make sure everybody has a chance to comment. So my suggestion, if possible, if we can just adopt um, what's being presented as is, and then can we make an amendment like at the next meeting or something? So, so I think, it's important, number one, that we don't um, delay what's before us because if we don't adopt our local standards, which in some instances are more stringent, we'll, we would be barred from that and the state codes would come into play uh, effective January 1. So I don't want to lose the traction for the good things that have already been done from a, from a safety perspective. Uh, secondarily, I think with regard to Chapter 7A, a text amendment or a code amendment could be processed very similarly to what is currently um, happening with, with this code amendment. It doesn't necessarily have to be January 1. Um, it's something that we could take a, a pause, a look at where, if, if not the entire city, would it be appropriate to apply a, a higher standard? Would it be residential? multifamily, which is residential and or commercial, because we have to take that into consideration as well. It, this would necessarily affect non-residential and commercial uh, properties as well. Um, I think navigating through those best desires and or practices with the building community, the designers, and, and re-engaging the building commission standards would be the appropriate way to, to walk this through. So that would be my recommendation to move forward with what's been presented, direct staff to circle back uh, with the building industry and, and the building code um, advisory committee and, and dial this in appropriately, taking into consideration the nuances of the languages, you know, what's the definition of new construction, what would trigger uh, these kinds of applications. I would agree with the vice mayor. I think this is a, it's a significant enough change and impact that I would like some more input from the building community and people considering building, uh, but understanding what our timeline is. Um, what I would propose is that we adopt the ordinance, waive the first reading as is, 
uh, but with direction to staff so that we meet the, the state requirement of January 1st. Um, because if we carry this over, then we need another 30 days, and when that puts us past uh, the deadline. But direct staff to, uh, with input from uh, city attorneys, uh, to review language as proposed by Councilmember Kraus, and if we could get some research on other cities that have gone this route, and then also, is there an industry standard that building to this is indeed, it's a 15 to 25 percent um, variance but you know to council member Krause's point he's he's raised this issue before um, we clear this by the January 1st but on this particular item 7a applying to the entire city I'd like to see this back in front of us relatively quickly I'd, I'd be perfectly happy with that as long as we get down the road on this kind of an amendment so, so capturing the minutes, we will bring this back very early in January. Second meeting in January. How's that? Um, but to get to the compliance and make sure that our more stringent standards on certain items are adopted before being waived over by the states. Uh, consensus on that? Uh -huh. Councilman McCross? Sure. All right. So with that, the recommended action this evening is to adopt the, uh, the ordinance um, waiving the first reading. Uh, which means it comes back on consent second time and you all know what that means if one of you would like to make that motion i'll do it uh, so i'll i'll move uh, the adoption of the ordinance and waive the first reading uh, we are adopting an ordinance of the city council of the city of calistoga repealing calistoga municipal code chapters 15.01 general provisions 15.04 administrative code 15.08 California Building Code, 15.12 California Residential Code, 15.16 California Electrical Code, 15.20 California Mechanical Code, 15.24 California Plumbing Code, 15.28 California Energy Code, 15.32 California Historical Building Code, 15.36 California Fire Code, 15.40 California Existing Building Code, 15.44 California Green Building Standards and 15.48 California Reference Standards of Title 15 Building Standards Codes and opting the 2019 California Building Standards Code Title 24 as adopted by the California State Building Standards Commission with local amendments and the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you if this is your first radio uh, rodeo when we waive the first reading we are required by law to read the entire title of the ordinance and this is an exceptionally long one fortunately if someone chooses to second this they do not have to read it again so do I have a second on this item second thank you we have a motion by vice mayor Dunsford we have a second by uh, council member Williams all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed Thank you very much. And staff, you are clear. Passage unanimously will come back to the council on consent next time. And staff, you are clear on the direction for consideration and information gathering on 7A's application to the rest of the city. Brad and Chief Campbell, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Moving on to General government item number five site plan for the Lope V picnic bocce and play area improvements the recommended action this evening is to consider approving the site plan taking us through this will be park and recreation welcome back Rachel hello thank you um, so in front of you guys is a site plan we were approached by a community interest group actually I believe the council was approached uh, the Adelante group that would like to see more recreational areas and opportunities in Calistoga. So we worked with them to develop a plan to kind of renovate Logvie. So it's the back southwest corner. <clears throat> it includes two bocce courts, a playground, and then some picnic areas. And that's kind of that's kind of it. Um, it's a projected to be about a $400,000 project. We did apply for a per capita grant. We're not sure what the allocation is on that yet. They're a little delayed in announcing that, so that'll probably come out 
in late January, we're hoping to get around $200,000 on that, which would go towards this project. That's so how about a little background, how long we've been working on this? Uh, since spring of 2018. Okay, and we've had tremendous community input and support on this. We have, yes. From the Adelante group, which I, I believe, believe we have some members of them are here of. tonight. Yes. If there's anyone that would like to uh, share on the presentation of this item, you're welcome to do so at this point. Any comments? All right, so we have clearly have a. I'm sorry, Zach. Please, absolutely. If I could help give a little bit of context to those that maybe aren't familiar with the project. So three years ago, um, the city in partnership with uh, Valley Family Center's Department of Public Health held a town hall meeting where we discussed um, with the community, what do you like about living here and what are some things that you'd like to see improved? And overwhelmingly the responses that came out from that night were, we would like to see more parks and recreation opportunities for families. So um, in partnership with the Family Center and some other um, organizations, we got a little bit of funding through the state for parent and family and um, leadership programming. Um, this group of parents, Adelante, came forward and said, we want to help. We want to figure out how to solve this problem. And so they've, for the last three years, been meeting Monday nights, and they've been working, <coughs> excuse me, um, to come up with the plans that you see before you. So they've surveyed the community. They've held um, mini town hall type events where they've asked, what would you like to see? What types of amenities would you like to see incorporated to something like this? And this is kind of the the results of three years worth of labor by these parents to come up with um, renderings that fit in with multiple interest groups um, designs for the park and also provide a place for families to come and enjoy um, the atmosphere created at the park. Thank you. I've been uh, I've participated in a couple of the meetings with the Adelante group and a, a couple of things that came through very clearly is it's a very engaged, very active uh, group, which I've sincerely appreciated from their very first presentation to us a couple of years ago um, through the consideration of this council, which has set aside some funding toward this project. Um, anytime you have your community and its residents and participants willing to roll up their sleeves and dedicate an incredible amount of time as this group has done and be very inclusive in who they've reached out to, um, we need to take advantage of that very clearly. Um, I think the work that you guys have done from all the different iterations um, from start to finish incorporates a lot of different interests, which is great. Um, I'm assuming that we've run this through uh, City Manager Kern. There don't, there don't appear to be any construction concerns or CEQA challenges um, we've taken those inputs into consideration we have and I, I think it's important to note that through the community engagement process we we made sure that the existing and primary function of the park was not diminished um, so it was very important um, for parks and rec and for me that we have the ability to continue to use it as a soccer field and a softball field and those kinds of things. And it was challenging to get all of these improvements tucked into a, a, a small discrete area. Um, I think there was a lot of um, cooperation in trying, you know, mashing a lot of stuff in there. Um, the biggest reason that we're bringing this forward to you tonight is that we're ready to start putting in some of the improvements. And before we did that, we wanted consensus on what this, I'll call it mini site plan amendment, um, looks like and what it's going to do. Uh, this is going to be a work in progress. Um, as funding is available, pieces will get uh, constructed. Um, one of the things that we, we can't lose sight of is the perimeter pathway uh, that is going to be a necessary and integral to the use of this facility. So it's taking baby steps to get to a bigger picture at the end of the day. Well, this has certainly, uh, will certainly enhance the use of this recreational facility uh, out at Logue V. Um, and this can be staged in such a way that it's not going to look awkward if one phase is done and the second and third phase isn't, um, how you roll this out and build out. We're, we're looking for opportunities where the low-hanging fruit is. How can we make some immediate improvements so that there is some synergy? Uh, we don't want to lose sight of the energy of the uh, Adelante group and, and the local users. 
Okay, so from a fiscal impact, we've got how much has already was already set aside? So there's a hundred thousand in your budget right now. Um, should we be should Rachel be successful in getting the grant? Assuming it's two hundred thousand, there's a twenty percent local match. Okay. Um, so two hundred plus a hundred. You're you gonna do the math for me. It's three hundred thousand. So if it's a four hundred thousand dollar project, we would be um, potentially requesting an additional hundred thousand uh, during the next budget cycle. In the next fiscal year. Yep. Okay. Any other council members with questions before I open it up to the public? Uh, yes, I just want to um, mention and um, that the Grupo Adelante is a group of uh, Latino parents that it was uh, willing. Uh, not to work only for the Latino community, but they want to embrace the whole community and and create um, a community project that it will be beneficial for all of us here. So, um, lo que les estoy diciendo es que quiero darle las gracias al Grupo Adelante por todo su trabajo de este tiempo. Y lo bonito del trabajo de que ustedes están haciendo es que no solamente están trabajando para la comunidad latina, sino para toda la comunidad en general y están, eh, es un proyecto que va a beneficiar completamente a toda la comunidad en general. Gracias. Thank you, um, Anyone in the public like to address this item? I, I have a question. Oh, sir, I'm sorry. <coughs> um, Vice Mayor Dunsford. The plan looks great. Um, I wanted to know, uh, I know Santa Lina has uh, a big bocce uh, court uh, set up down there. Did you consult a anybody in terms of the just the planning of the ele the different elements around the, the bocce court? Like I, I know there's there used to be an individual um, uh, that was a bocce expert and lived in Santa Lina, and he he championed uh, us to have a bocce ball. Uh, bocce court up here many years ago so I just didn't know who uh, did you talk to anybody about the design and no I think our primary mm -hmm. concern was trying to draw in as many users that would use the mm -hmm. space so to try to kind of um, you know create some different aspects to it mm -hmm. and also like Mike said um, making sure that we kept the space for soccer to still be able to take place so we did you know we took into account the size and and the placement so that it would still accommodate soccer, but that other people could use this space as well. With regards to the soccer field, um, with the, the location of the bocce courts and the fencing, does, does that diminish uh, the size of the soccer field? Is the soccer field still a standard it's size? It's still regulation right, size. Regulation soccer. size? Yes, correct. And the path around the perimeter, is that's concrete? Um, that would probably be concrete. We haven't totally decided on that yet, but and that's going to go around ADA, um, the, the entire uh, right. The, the plan right. is for it to go around the entire grass area. Correct. I think that was one of the big problems on the Rotary Club wanting to put the bocce ball court in is, is that the requirement for the ADA compliance. Right. Yeah. Right. Any other questions on council? I, yeah, I have a question. Yes, of course, I want to compliment um, the Atlante group. Uh, I enjoyed going <coughs> going to their meetings a couple of times as well. And I'm sensing a greater um, involvement among uh, community members here, a greater sense of energy. So I also appreciate that. Um, I wonder, uh, Rachel, you prepared or um, City Manager Kern, could you outline where that 400,000 goes, here we see the trees and the bocce ball courts, and there's concrete apparently around. Could you, you know, broadly outline where that 400,000 is anticipated to go? Yeah, so if you'll notice, there is a play structure, so a portion of it will go to that, and then the actual construction of the bocce courts. And the pathway, I've been told, is probably roughly 250,000. So that's, that's a big chunk right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone in the public wishing to address this? Anyone from Adelante? You guys have done a great job on this. We really appreciate it. All right. With that said, thank you very much. So you are looking for direction on this? I think just a, a motion by consensus that the site plan is 
acceptable. All right. I'll entertain a motion as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Dunsford, a second by Council Member Williams. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nope. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you again very much. And uh, please share with those members of Adelanta that couldn't be here our appreciation for that. Let's get going. Um, moving on, item number six, received update on fairgrounds acquisition financing and property condition assessment and provide direction to staff. The recommended action is to receive the presentation from fairgrounds financing team, property condition assessment and operations and provide direction to staff. City Manager Kern, are you taking us through this? I'll, I'll get it started and then All hand right. it off to Gloria. Um, so as your council is aware, uh, the city has uh, negotiated a purchase agreement with the County of Napa for approximately 34 acres of the Napa County Fairgrounds at Calistoga. We are in our wrapping up our 120 day due diligence period. Um, several <coughs> actions that your council will be asked to take uh, in the next couple of meetings are authorization for um, issuance of certificates of participation to finance the acquisition and then you know ultimately the the go no go um, we're gonna buy the property a decision also so I will get into some of the things that we've discovered um, in our review and analysis of the property um, but what I'd like to do right now is have Gloria introduce the finance uh, team that was assembled. Uh, they have a presentation that they want to walk you through on uh, some questions that we would need direction on or answers we need direction on um, regarding what is the threshold for annual debt service uh, that your council would be um, acceptable, um, whether or not uh, tax exempt financing is something that you would like to entertain and then I think the last one would be um, assuming we move forward would it be a 30-year note or a 20-year note uh, for debt service and so with that I'd turn it over to Gloria thank you uh, city manager Kern Did welcome back Gloria it's nice to be back again um, so we've been working with this team for the last um, couple of months um, some of the team members are the same ones that we had when we did the um, wastewater uh, and water debt service back in 2018 and so we brought um, the, some of those members back so we've got urban uh, urban futures and uh, the person who's been our lead person on that is as wing C Fox um, she pretty much handles all of our agendas uh, all our meetings and um, a great person to have on board because she understands the whole um, picture of how to do a, a bond financing structure so we've got her on board we've also got uh, Rick and um, Nikki Tallman and Nikki's actually here today for us they helped us with our 2007 bond lease when we did um, the, the restructuring and we were able to do some improvements at the pool and um, the fire station and the police station so we've got her on board today we've also got uh, from Jones Hall uh, David Fama who also helped us in our um, wastewater and uh, water debt service and uh, David Fama has brought uh, two other individuals who actually will talk to you about taxable and non-taxable bonds and I, I just met them today and I'm trying to remember uh, their names I think it was David David and then was it Earl Earl and so uh, they're all here with us today so I'm going to turn it over to them um, to do the presentation on, 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 on how we can structure the bonds thank you Thank you, Gloria. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, it's good to be back here presenting to you. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with Mike and Gloria the last couple months, and we wanted to give you an update on where we are with the financing. Um, so Jones Hall, who has brought a big team here tonight, they've been drafting the legal documents and the offering document. The team has been reviewing those documents. Uh, we've also prepared a rating presentation, and we will be back here on Thursday presenting to S&P and then also having them tour some of the development in the city as well as the fairgrounds. So we're very excited about that. Um, basically, we are on schedule to come back to council on December 3rd with the full financing package and form documents uh, for you to approve and authorize the, the certificates of participation. 
So one of the other updates is the leased properties that have been selected. We are going to be using the fairgrounds itself as, where, as well as the fire station, which has been released from the 2007 capital lease and available for this transaction. The closing on the fairgrounds will have to happen simultaneously with the closing of the certificates of participation same day. So this evening, um, we are looking for some direction from the council regarding the tax status, um, whether you want to see a mix of taxable tax exempt bonds or fully taxable. And um, I won't steal Dave's thunder because that's his thing. <laughs> he will be presenting uh, on the, 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 the tax exempt and taxable aspects of municipal bond debt issuance, um, the advantages and disadvantages. We're also looking for some direction on the term. Uh, very typical to have 30-year term for acquisition or capital improvement debt. Um, 20 years, as you'll see, is a less overall debt service, but a higher annual debt service burden. And ultimately, we'll be looking for some guidance to what you'd like to see the general fund overall debt service burden to be, including the 2007 capital lease. Um, we are anticipating some big developments coming online, increased revenues, um, but that won't be coming online for at least a year or two. So do we want to structure the debt service uh, at a certain threshold for those years while we anticipate those developments coming online? Um, and we'll show you the different options that we run um, on the different structures uh, to get some guidance from you. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dave Walton, who will talk about the tax status of the bonds. Thank you, Wincy. So this, this, is, this is going to be probably the most exciting thing that the council will, will probably hear the entire year. We get to talk about federal tax matters. Excellent. Uh, um, I, I used to work at, at the Office of Chief Counsel and the Department of Treasury Office of Tax Policy, and I um, was able to write to some of the regulations and rulings that govern this area. So I like to tell everybody, the rules that you like, uh, yeah, I, I, I was involved with those, but the, the ones that are not so good, yeah, that was somebody else. Seems um, fair. Um, you, you have got uh, a facility that you can do a lot of things with. And so um, in order for us to do a, a thorough tax analysis, we really need to know what your plans are and your long-term plans are for the facility. Um, in, order f uh, in order for bonds, the pros, the, 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 the big pro, and we have, uh, speaking of pros, two of them here, Nikki can tell you, it, you will get a lower interest rate and the money will cost you less if you finance it tax exempt. You, you folks have done uh, your water and your wastewater and, and uh, you know you save money by issuing bonds on a tax and basis you get a lower interest rate but uh, Uncle Sam wants you to follow some rules that uh, I will be honest with you a lot of times don't make uh, economic sense when you're when you have a facility such as this it just depends on what you want to do you want to turn that whole thing into a, a public park that's a no-brainer. We can we can do it tax exempt. That's easy. Um, but but I let we can just go through these these slides quickly. It, it, it's probably more detail than you want, but we can stop anywhere you'd like and and discuss the detail. The cons is the is the city uh, must comply with federal tax rules. The rules limit the types of uh, costs that can be financed, and they limit the uh, use of the facilities. And they also limit uh, any changes down the road. Say you try one thing, doesn't work out, you want to change it. Federal tax rules may, in some circumstances, uh, cause problems there. Uh, and if you fail to comply with the federal tax rules, then the IRS will say, can possibly say, well, uh, the interest that was paid on those bonds that the bondholders got to exclude from their taxes, they shouldn't have. And, as, and they can go back to the open uh, years under the statute of limitations, generally three years, and then forward and say all that interest is taxable, and they'll tax the bondholders, and then the bondholders will sue you because you said you wouldn't do things to make the bonds taxable. Okay? That never happens. 
what happens is you get an audit and the IRS says we don't like it and we argue with them and they, everybody comes to an agreement and some usually they go away sometimes you write them a check but I'm just telling you worst case scenario they can go after the bondholder okay the, can we go to the next slide thank you um, the proceeds generally must be spent on capital expenditures this will be pretty easy uh, the fairgrounds property so land the event center RV park speedway construction rehab design architect planning and engineering what we call soft costs those are all financeable with taxes and bonds as long as we have our appropriate uses uh, proceeds generally may not be spent on operating or other working capital costs so if you're going to have some initial startup costs um, and you say well but yeah the the this thing's gonna operate at a loss for a few years can we build some money into our bonds to pay for that the answer is generally no you there is an exception you can use up to five percent of your bond proceeds for initial operating costs uh, an example would be you're, you're starting up a revenue producing facility and while you're waiting for it to produce revenues you need some working capital to pay salaries and and run the operation um, but they have to be related to the facility but ge so generally if you're thinking no we, we need to fund a big deficit on this thing for a while Generally, you can't finance that with taxes and bonds, although we can talk about doing, <laughs> doing working capital financings. But like I said, it's really exciting and fun area, but we don't, we don't want to get, we can really get deep in the weeds. Uh, proceeds generally may not, uh, the city has to reasonably expect to spend the bond proceeds within three years. Um, the, I, this, this can be a problem, generally not with municipalities, but... Uh, other entities uh, redevelopment agencies <laughs> usually don't sp don't spend their money quickly the IRS their idea is wait a minute we're giving you this big subsidy they lost the Supreme Court case uh, the states don't think that it's a subsidy they think they're entitled to tax exemption. they lost so the IRS now says tax exemption is a subsidy and the go federal government is giving you this great benefit and they want results pronto so if you're gonna borrow money and have this tax exempt subsidy they want to see the governmental facility quick so they say spend your money within three years it has to be a reasonable expectation so that means if you're out there and you start digging the hole and for whatever you're gonna build and all of a sudden you you you, you hit something you, you hit a fossil uh, a dinosaur bone everything comes to a screeching halt and you know they have to go in and do a dig and all. okay that then you're justified for not you thought you're gonna do it in three years but you know or somebody files a lawsuit or you have some environmental problem that you didn't anticipate but it has to be generally an expectation for three years so when you issue the bonds we would want a a drawdown expect a drawdown schedule you know we expect to spend the money over this period of time usually a, a quarterly drawdown schedule based upon reasonable expectations you say well no this project's going to take five years and we would do multiple series of bonds we do the a series for the first three and then a second series for the next two um, you can reimburse certain costs that were paid prior to the acquisition of the project I don't know how much of that you have uh, if you've paid to have some specific studies done some architectural engineering uh, we can reimburse that I don't know if we've done a reimbursement resolution but I don't think we have any hard costs we have okay uh, so um, you probably we, we can recoup a lot if not all of the costs that you have incurred directly with respect to the project up to date right now um, we go to the next slide please restrictions on private use and payments um, this this is again this is I don't want to waste a lot of your time on this this is going to be very specific to what you want to do with the project but private business use is is generally prohibited the idea behind a governmental bond is you finance a, a, a facility like a fire station a city hall it's it's it is a governmental 
function. It's performing a governmental function. And the other big exception is a facility that is used by the general public, a public park, a public parking garage, first come, first serve parking garage. So those are all governmental. A private use would be, let's say you, you, um, you, you, you have the fairgrounds. I know you have a racetrack out there. And let's say you want to keep the racetrack. And, you, and uh, there's an entity that is a commercial racing operation, and they want to lease the racetrack from you. That lease is a private use. That, is a gover that would be a governmentally financed facility, but it's then leased to a private entity for use in, the, in a for-profit trade or business. Okay? That is a private use, and generally the portion of your bond proceeds allocable to those uses can't exceed 10%. So the, this is something that uh, I want this to, to discuss this concept so you, as you try and decide what, what are you going to do with the fairgrounds out there? How do you want to operate it? And you say, well, that, you know, that doesn't make any sense. It, 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 you know, cities aren't in the business of running racetracks. Of course we'd want to lease it to somebody that knows what they're doing. Plus we make money off of the lease. Yes, it makes economic sense. But remember, we're dealing with the federal government and Congress and the Internal Revenue Code. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, the private payment or security test, I want to spend a lot of time on that. That, that just has to do with if you, have, if, you have a, if you have private use, like the, the lease, but let's say you leased the racetrack for a dollar a year, you wouldn't have a problem because you also have to have at least a more than 10% payments. So... If you know, if you basically want to give the facility away, or or lease it, or allow uses that are exclusive for relatively small amounts of money, you can do that. Um, and private users defined uh, at the bottom here any non-state or local governmental entity. Now, this will surprise you. This includes a 501c3 organization, a nonprofit, a charity that you make a contribution to and you get a deduction, they are treated as private users. Now, we could do the bonds as qualified 501c3 bonds, or that would be okay if you were going to have some charitable nonprofit organization use it, but they would have to use it for an unrelated trade or not, for something that isn't unrelated trade or business, basically for a charitable purpose. It's the fairgrounds. I don't know how much charitable pur purpose out there, but, you know, these are your options. Uh, federal agencies. This is another strange one. Let's say the federal government says, "Yeah, um, you know, you're going to build. You're going to have. You have some buildings out there." They say, "We well, we'd like to rent some space from you." The federal government is treated as a private entity. Now, what if the state came and wanted to lease some space or the county? That's okay. They're state and local government entities, but the federal government is a private entity. Um, For-profit entities, we talked about that, corporations, partnerships, and even individuals. And, you know, an individual says, hey, can I rent some space out there for my, for my office, for my uh, insurance business, or my retail store? That's, that's a private use. Let's go to the next slide. And I, I know I'm talking fast. If you want to interrupt me and say, this makes no sense, what are you talking about? I'm happy to. Activities generating private business use. Okay, special legal entitlements. This is fancy legal term for basically this, this list of things. Leases, subleases, or rentals. Management contracts. Now, there's big exceptions. The IRS has a, proced uh, has a procedure out there for uh, safe harbor for what we call qualified management contracts. Very common. For example, most cities um, with, with a parking garage, uh, don't normally have city employees manage the parking garage. They'll hire a parking company. And as, as long as the management contract meets certain compensation uh, requirements and term requirements, uh, that won't be treated as a private use. The biggest prohibition to remember is you can never have an agreement where you compensate your manager on the basis of net profits. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. We want to motivate the manager to maximize the facility, to maximize the revenue, maximize the use or whatever, and what's going to motivate them more than getting a, a share of net profits. And we've all heard the term, oh, public-private partnerships. Well, it doesn't work with taxes at municipal bonds. Generally, no. You can't have net profits. 
uh, licenses. So I, you know, I don't know how relevant that would be, but a, a license, is like a lease or rental, is going to be treated as private use. Exclusive use arrangements, priority use policies, and similar type arrangements. We'll get to, to these in the uh, on the next page if we can go to it. Where this is this is the this is the big uh, exception on on financing with taxes and bonds is the private business use. The definition there's an exception for general public use, and I've, I've already touched on it. Example: You have an outdoor area, a, an event center, the Great Lawn, open to the public. It's a public park. Um, you know, anybody can go there. It's open from you know, sun, sunrise to sunset, uh, that's fine. Well, what, what if, what if uh, a, a, a company comes there and has their company picnic and they're a business? doesn't matter. They're using it on the same basis as members of the general public. Qualified management contracts. We've discussed that already. And if, you're inter if, you, and if you plan on doing some management contracts, which I would imagine if you keep the RV, um, the RV uh, park that you have there, you probably don't want to have city people managing that. You probably want a manager. Um, I think it's it's very likely that you could get a management contract that would comply with the with the safe harbor and have somebody manage it for you. Could you tell me about safe? Excuse me. Uh, tell me about safe harbor. I don't know that term. Well, it it's 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 a term. It, it's a, we use in the tax code. It's it is basically the IRS will not challenge you and your activity if you meet these requirements that they've published as a safe harbor. And so it'll say, if, if your management contract has the right compensation formula, doesn't do net profits, and if it isn't too long, if it doesn't go for more than 80% of the life of the facility, and a few other little things, that then if an IRS came in and audited it, and they said, oh, you've got a management contract, you would hand them that, and you'd say, and oh, look, here's your publication saying say here's the safe harbor we've met the safe harbor and the agent would say fine you know that's why they call it a safe you know, a boat in a safe harbor somebody made that up years ago and anyway that's what it means thank you um the incidental use this is this is a small thing you can have like vending machines and and things like that uh you know back the, the regulations have a thing about pay phones i don't know if they even exist anymore but um, those small things like that we can ignore. Not big things, but little things. Certain short-term certain short arrangements. Now, this could apply to you folks. Um, if you, uh, uh, you know, make improvements out there, you have exhibition areas or whatever, and you have entities that say, well, we'd like to come in and we'd like to rent it for one week a year, uh, for the next five years and we want this week for the next five years as long as it's open to the public first come first serve uh, and if the days don't add up to more than 50 100 or 200 those those days are dependent on the nature of the facility and again we're getting into the weeds and until we know what you want to do I don't want to waste your time uh, but you could do that it's common with convention centers um, where you know the XYZ convention comes in and says I want to uh, we'd like to have the, the 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 third weekend of July every year for the next five years for four days for the XYZ convention um, and that would usually work because it would be less than um, you know one of these days and in that case it would probably be the 100 day requirement uh, and, and then we gave the example of the of the speedway uh, you know, four race, race weekends a year, something like that. That'd be a little more difficult, though, because then we need to know well, what happens with the other time. Is it just vacant? Is there going to be any other possible use of the speedway? Because the IRS will ask that. Say, well, you know, if no one else will ever use it, then it's kind of exclusive to the speedway guy. Uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, general public use, natural individuals are not engaged in a trade or business. This is important for your RV park out there. Um, let, let's say you wanted to turn it into, rather than a temporary RV park where people 
can stay there for, I think, a maximum of two weeks, you say, well, no, we'll allow somebody to put a double wide there or something like that. Uh, and they'd have an annual lease. Well, that's, that, that's long term. But use by a natural person, and a natural person is just us in this room. We're not engaged in a trader business. You just, you, you, you're living in your house and you're not doing a business. That's called a natural person. You can have a long-term arrangement there and not be a private business use. Something to consider if that's what you wanted to do with the RV park or something like that. Uh, and we have done that. We've had cities where there were mobile home parks and a developer comes in and says, oh man, this property is valuable. Let's, let's, let's throw grandma out, raise the mobile home park, and we're going to put in luxury condos. And the city says, no, 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 we're going to protect these people. And they go in, they condemn the property, they buy it from the developer, and then they lease out the pads to the people with the, with the um, portable housing already on them. That's fine, because the people, and that, yes, and then we have a covenant that everybody agrees they're not going to run a trader business out of their mobile home. Okay, well, what if somebody is, you know, in their computer, you know, doing bookkeeping on the side out of their mobile home? Well, good luck, IRS. Audit that and figure it out. You know, no, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, use by, uh, if the facility is, re so it has to be reasonably available to, on the same basis to members of the general public. Okay, let's, let's say you decide to put a municipal swimming pool out there. Um, and there's a local group that uh, has uh, uh, the, the, what do they call it, the synchronized swimming or a water polo team. And they say, we want, we want a guarantee of every, you know, every weeknight during the summer from, from 5 to 7 for our practices. They, you can't do that. You, you, the only way you could do that is if they are first in line in a first come first serve reservation process. Okay, that's what general public means. Um, rate classes are permitted, but again, th this is this is getting too much in the weeds until we know what you want to do. Let's can we go to the next slide? General considerations: um, what costs are being financed at the fairgrounds property? Acquisition, we've talked about planning, construction, and then we've talked about O&M, how that will be limited. Uh, what uses could occur? This is, this is for you folks to, to, uh, to discuss. You know, you can have public available parks and sports fields. You can continue with the RV park. You can have event center with space uh, rentals. Retail and food concessions. That's one thing I want to talk to you about. This is pretty common in public park facilities, fairground facilities, it's pretty rare for a municipality to run its own food uh, and beverage services with city employees. And it's, uh, in, in my experience, it's also rare, though not impossible, to find a concessionaire to agree to operate a food or beverage facility under that will fit within the safe harbor of the management contract rules. Most of them say, no, no, look, you just lease me that space and then I'll, I'll run my restaurant or cafe or, or beverage hut or whatever there. That's more common. Okay, so what do we do? Well, um, you heard Nikki and uh, Wing C, they're going to tell you, well, we can, we can do part of this taxable. Or again, we have the 10% that we can have what we call the bad cost. Well, if you're only going to have like a little kiosk out there with a with a with a, a, a you know a little snack shack, well, that's going to fit within your 10 percent, and then we don't worry about it. Um, the, the, we talked about management contracts. Who could be using the fairgrounds? The public, state, and government, local government. Absolutely, if the county says, "Hey, can we rent some space?" Um, yeah, sure. Uh, we have a really special price for them when they want to rent I, it back from us. I, I kind of figured you would. We, we've, we've, we've heard about the negotiations with the county. I mean, my suggestion was is you hand them the bill for the ADA problems out there. But. Uh, third party event uh, or RV park managers and for-profit companies. 
And so I'm through my slides. I, I went a little quick, but um, this is probably more detail than you wanted. Uh, but I'm, uh, you know, I'd be happy to answer some questions. These these two ladies can help uh, discuss the, the financing options and tell you the you know the difference in cost you're looking at if you said no we're going to do it taxable. Now one thing about that if if you do, you say well we don't know what we're going to do with that that fair we ju we just don't know. Um, there's there's two there's two approaches. One is you can say well. Um, let's just issue do the whole thing taxable then we don't have the tax tail wagging the dog here you can then do whatever makes the best financial sense for you uh, and once you figure that out and the smoke clears and you've and you've got you've got your master plan put in place out there then you look and you come and talk to, to, to Dave Fahm and me and we and you say well here's what we're doing now and it turns out we say oh well, 80% of what you're doing is governmental. We can finance that tax exempt. We could we could then refinance or refund the taxable bonds with tax exempt bonds. And um, Nikki can talk to you about you know how how expensive will that be? What you know what are your options there? It could be expensive. It could work. Um, another thing you can say is no, we don't we don't think we're going to have uh, uh, this private use stuff. We think we're going to figure out the racetrack thing, or you know, and so you do it all tax tax exempt. Or you say, you know, the racetrack that's 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 kind of the odd odd thing out. Let's let's do that one taxable because we aren't so sure. But the rest of it, we know we're going to be all public. Then we do part taxable, part tax exempt. And uh, do you have to identify? The specific piece of property that's going to be used for tax or tax exempt. Usually, you use the example of the racetrack, and that might not be tax exempt. Let's just say. So, when we do this, do we say, well, we want three million dollars, let's say, for, or let's say, a million dollars for uh, taxable? Uh, certificates of participation because we have the racetrack um, so do you identify it in that manner or do you just say 50% uh, of everything we do here is going to be for profit and 50% of everything we do here throughout the whole facility is going to be governmental do, do you do you have to identify a specific location on the property in our case or can you just say Generally speaking, 50% of the activity here uh, is going to be tax exempt or government related. That's a great question. If you'd asked me that a couple of years ago, I would have said, yes, you have to do that. About, oh, I guess almost three years ago, the IRS changed the rules and they actually did a very good change. They said that if you use tax exempt bond proceeds, and non-tax debt proceeds, we call it equity, to finance a project. And we'll, the whole fairgrounds thing is, would be your project. That the equity proceeds are allocated first to whatever is not a governmental public use. So under your example, let's say that we finance 80% tax exempt and 20% taxable. Uh, and the whole thing cost ten million dollars, and the racetrack was two million, and the other was eight million. And it turns out that yes, the racetrack you're going to lease out to some for-profit entity, and they're going to run a racetrack there. Even if we didn't say in the documents that the twenty percent, the two million dollars went to the racetrack, automatically under the tax rules. The $2 million of cash that you put into the deal gets allocated to the racetrack, and all the bond proceeds get allocated to the good government stuff, the park and, and all that. So, yes, up front, we, we still try and identify just so we know we, we have our percentages right. But at the end of the day, whatever is, is private use gets allocated the equity first, if there's equity in the transaction. And there's some rule that says, well, you can't say that you know we put equity in 10 years ago, and now we're issuing bonds today, 
and then that 10 year old no it has to be it has to be pretty much uh, at, at, at well the ta taxable bonds would be is equity yeah when I say when I say equity that that could be taxable bonds too it's just equity means anything that is not tax exempt bond proceeds so yeah um, that would work uh, we would like to have you identify up front but we we aren't we aren't stuck with that and in fact if you're saying well, we we don't know we just know that we want 20 percent of our facility available as a floating bad use we can do that too yeah because i it's confusing enough to me and i'm sure uh other people that are listening to this just what we oh yeah you know can can do and 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 can't do in the name of pro, uh, for profit or uh my my concerns over there uh, are that we do have a lot of fundraising that occurs over there. Uh, every service club uh, in this community raises considerable amounts of money for hoedowns and crab feeds and barbecues, you know, all kinds of, of activities like that. And that's one of the things that's attractive to this city. Uh, council is to make sure that we can keep those activities up so um, uh, and then there's the other things I think that are pretty much uh, on everybody's mind is that uh, uh, we've used that as an evacuation center it's been used as a uh, instant command post for the for Cal fire for major fires it's you know which are governmental uh, that's about as governmental as you can get it, it, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and when those uh, needs come up if somebody has a schedule event over there uh, I'm sure the fairgrounds has a clause in there that says we can cancel your contract for this kind of an emergency kind of a thing so uh, someone renting the fairgrounds for uh, uh, let's say an anniversary party or something like that not a problem not a problem as long as you have first come first serve policy uh, how about a church let's say there was a church wanted to um, temporarily hold services in in one of the buildings is is the, that any kind of a problem the under the establishment clause the Supreme Court on a tax case has said that's okay for federal tax purposes we would want to look at it the California Constitution is more stringent on the use of governmental facilities for religious purposes and we would want to look at that and I'd want to consult with uh, with my partner Dave Fama on that that particular I mean we use. don't have that use over there right now but uh, but it could happen you know someone could approach us and say we want I think we used to have church services in here for Highland Christian Church for quite a few years and, and, and you know and it, I, I believe as long as it's first come first serve and you say oh yeah we have a schedule and you go down to City Hall and the city clerk or whoever is in charge of it and first come first serve you come in and you say well it's available these hours and you know you sign up and that that that's public and the only the only thing I would ask then is that they would say well we want to sign up for every Sunday for the next 10 years well okay we, we want to look at that that then now we're getting into this Remember that 50, 100, 200 day slide. Okay, I'm, I've got a better grip on what the different things are, the different <coughs> so activities. So, a couple questions, sorry. Is this a good break for questioning? This is a... Is it tax specific? Yes, thanks. Um, See, tax is fun. I know. Actually, I must say you did a great job distilling this down and oh. making it digestible. <laughs> um, thank you for that. You know, a, a initial thought is, yeah, I'd love to make everything you know, tax exempt, et cetera. And then you start looking at the triggers that create, you know, for lack of a better word, a violation. And some of the ones that you've named are certainly things that it has been used, the facilities have been used for in the past. And I think that we would consider using in the future. While again, we're just looking at a real estate transaction. We've made no decision on the use of the facility, blah, blah, blah. Um, it is public purpose, open space. Um, however, it's an asset that we need to get a return on. So, to Gary's point, if I understood you correctly, letting 501c3 registered service clubs, even though their intention is good for the fundraiser they're having, 
is actually a private use? Not if it's first come, first serve, and any okay. other member of the public. So let's say that you wanted to have a family reunion over there. And you go down and you can sign up just like the service clubs? No. That would, that and we could charge them for it? Yep. It, 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 you have a rate schedule. And you mm -hmm. say, it's this much an hour. We don't care who you are. You know, first come, first serve. Then, uh, no, you can do that. Okay. And it's very common. You know, that's how convention centers work. That's how right. cities can finance convention centers. Okay. I, I have another yep. question. Uh, could we have different rates for different organizations? For instance, you want to come in and have a private party for New Year's Eve in there. Uh, we have one price, but if we have a 501c3, the uh, Seroptimus Club, <coughs> Club comes in and wants to rent the, the building for crab feed. Does can we charge one less than the other, or does it always have to be the? Generally, you you can for your New Year's Eve example is a good one. You can say, you know, that holidays are prime time, so you can charge more on holidays. But when you start distinguishing between types of use, that could be problematic. That that one. We would, I'd want to see your specific proposal. Yeah. But you could say, well, this high demand is weekends and holidays, and therefore instead of, you know, $25 an hour, we charge $100 an hour. You know, that, that's fine. And it's a public schedule. So, you know, if you wanted to have the Seroptimus wanted to use it on the weekend, they're 100 bucks. If they want to use it on a Wednesday, they're 25 bucks. And it's the same way with, you know, you and the family reunion. Um, you know, and one of, one now, of the things I hear from, from the public is, is that here we have a service club that's basically taking all of the proceeds, uh, net proceeds from an event and giving it to good public purpose in town, whether it be for the swimming pool or scholarships at the high school or mm -hmm. all, all kinds of stuff. And the objection is, currently is how expensive it is to rent those buildings so uh, I, I guess what you're saying is is if they're renting it on Sunday night uh, to for a, a New Year's Eve party and it's a hundred bucks if the same Sunday night comes up and the Sroptimus wants to have a crab feed it's a hundred bucks well yeah I mean let we may we you know you, I mean, this, this is a tough question. Like if you said, well, no, we have, a, we have a different rate for charitable organizations versus for-profit organizations. I would want to look at that. And I, I, haven't, I need to do a little research on that. You, that, might, that might work. Because, I, yeah, because I, you're not distinguishing between a particular organization. You're distinguishing between, between classes. And, you know, like you're saying, the charitable organization is performing a quasi-governmental purpose by the fundraising, where they're contributing back to the community, whereas the New Year's Eve party, not so much. Um, you know, the, this we, we this is where we need, need to see a specific proposal. I, you know, I can't give you. And the sticking point we always get into that, and it was the same with the organization that was currently running it, is whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit, it costs you something to run that facility, and somebody has to pay that, for that. That's so. correct. Um, are we going to the next few slides, and we reserve the right, we reserve the right to come back to oh, you. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm here. Are you going to share with us the impact of these decisions? Yes, I think I have some good news for you. If you have a headache. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And that's because in the current market, there really isn't a huge differential between the taxable tax exempt market. And uh, assuming could have led with that, you know. <laughs> I, would I was trying to stand up as Dave was talking. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> um, so, you know, if it's I'm smarter because of Dave's presentation, though, no. so it's okay. Dave mm -hmm. is, is wonderful. Um, he's really a guru in this in this area. Um, but so the, the good news is if you are having a headache trying to think about the process and deciding what the ultimate use will be and you want to take the time to have those community meetings and make those decisions. Um, we don't want to have them. We have to have them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, then, you know, a taxable, right now, if, again, if the market is still the same when we go to price, uh, it's about, th it's less than $40,000 a year difference 
right now in this type of market. Um, a larger impact to the debt service is whether you want a shorter term or a longer term. So here, and I, hope I know the numbers are very small and I apologize, um, but we ran four scenarios, uh, Nikki and I ran four scenarios here with fully taxable 30 year, fully taxable 20 year, and then we ran scenarios with half tax exempt taxable 30 year, half taxable tax exempt 20 year. So you could see the impact on overall debt service that you pay um, throughout the life of the bonds and then also what annual debt service looks like. So we do want to get some direction uh, at this point about where you're leaning. Um, and again, uh, as Dave mentioned, if it turns out uh, that there are most of its tax exempt purposes, we can refund. Um, right now in the market, it still tends to be you know nine, eight, maybe eight year calls or 10 year calls. So it is a while from now, but the good news is you can advance refund these taxable bonds with tax exempt bonds. So there is that always that option. Um, and we did highlight the first few years, again, to get a sense of whether there is a threshold for debt service as we wait for um, some of these resorts to come online and expected revenues um, to come to fruition. And um, as you can see, with the fully taxable 30 year, for example, we've added in the 2007 lease obligation because that's also a general fund obligation. Um, it falls off after fiscal year 2028 and debt service drops off after that. Um, and then in the first few years, you can see it ranges from about 895,000 to about 1.06 million annual debt service, depending on the mix of the tax status and the final term of the bonds. Any questions? This schedule is really helpful. This is uh, you know, the, one of the best pages in the whole package that you offered us. And by the way, I want to compliment the city manager's office too for preparing this uh, package on the fairgrounds. I thought it was really well done. So my thinking, colleagues, is as she's indicating that um, we want this uh, facility to be for the use and enjoyment of the community and we don't I don't think we want to um, saddle the city 20 years down the road with um, restrictions when we really don't know what we want to, uh, you know, how it's going to be used. You know, and the, the, the cost difference isn't that it's much. It's not that much. No. It's, it's a million dollars, a little over a million dollars over 30 years. So it's not that much a difference. I, I was going to propose going with Dave's suggestion. You go taxable to begin with, and after yeah. you've got a few years under your belt, if it looks like if we see it's you can make that shift yeah. um yeah and i think that with the caveat of the call date and restrictions just, around that yeah. yeah and i like the idea of the 30 year um to keep the uh payments low to maximize our flexibility if revenue comes in and we want to pay it off sooner then uh then we there's no prepayment penalty i think um usually there's a lockout period so assume between eight and ten years you can't Call the bonds okay. now. Advance refundings means you can put the money away um, yeah. for you know two years or so before. But yeah. And then with the thirty year, the payments are a little bit lower, especially in the beginning, as they indicate in the notes, and that. Um, it's less than a hundred thousand dollars difference between a twenty year non taxable, yeah, or taxable, fully taxable, twenty years and thirty years. The 20 year it looks like is less than a hundred thousand dollars more expensive um, Maybe something. yep I'm gonna open to the public in a second any other input Council member uh, sorry, one, yep, more, sorry. one more thing about the highlighted years is this where the hammer falls you give oh, us the really <laughs> bad news no no no. it's still good news um, just looking for direction um, the highlighted years are the years where we're thinking okay um, we're still waiting for the revenues to come online um, right now we have it as level debt but if in those just those years you want a little bit less we will want that direction because we can structure so that as we're waiting for the new revenues it's a little bit less in those next couple years um, and then you sort of make up for it, spread it across the rest of the years. Okay. My, uh, my only comment is, I mean, t for me, there's, there's just no uh, question that it's too restrictive to be uh, uh, non-taxable. And I think we don't want th that restriction. And it makes sense for us to uh, figure things out. And in the future, 
if it's if there's a clear delineated portion of the property that we think is just going to be a public park and just sit there and never change then it would be um, consider it at that time come back to it all right with that said I will what, open what this kind of a interest rate are we looking at here so um, on this fully taxable is, is 4.8 4, yeah 4.7 4 4.8% the all the true interest cost so you know with public offerings you have these serial maturities in the beginning where you're selling one year debt to your debt so it's not like one straight 4.8 um, but all in blended it's less than 5% for taxable all right thank you so I'll open it up to the public with the distinction that we are here to discuss whether if you have comments or feelings or questions about whether this should be taxable or non taxable 20 year or 30 year we're not here to discuss what the uses on the property will be okay with that said we are open to the public yeah you have to do have to come up to the podium unfortunately you know, I know it's a long walk or we can bring it to you uh, we do have a big studio audience so should you so choose share with us your name and your address and ask your question uh, my name is Fred Cavan my address is 2335 Grant Street can you tell me what rating you expect to get from S&P because you must have one if you are quoting interest rates Yeah, you need to talk. Speak in the mic as well. Thank you. Thank you. So right now we're estimating in the single A category, um, but you know this is going to be the first general fund credit, at least in a long time, um, to be rated. So it's not like we can rely on the last rating on the bonds. But that's what we're estimating. Um, but we are meeting with S and P on Thursday, and we will know by December second. And so by the December third meeting, we'll be able to report out what that rating will be. Yeah, I can tell you, single-A corporates are not that high, so I'm surprised at the interest rate. 4.8, 4.9 sounds high for a single-A credit. This includes the costs as well for the for some of the costs for the TIC insurance. Um, so it's a blended, blended rate. Okay, and is there any uh, credit enhancement available? If it's a single-A category, then yes, we will be pursuing. Uh, Insur bond insurance as well as a surety policy for debt service reserve and we should get those bids on December 3rd if if we end up um, in the double-a category then we would not pursue credit okay, enhancement. can you explain to me this I don't understand this capital lease and this certificate of participation I know what a muni bond is but what what is this capital lease and this what is this your certificate of participation and what so a certificate of participation and or lease revenue bond is it's a lease appropriation type of credit so it means that every year um, council has to appropriate for those lease payments and and so under the Constitution California Constitution it's not considered voter approval debt um, but so because of that there's also it mimics a lease um, and also Dave Fama can speak to more details of the legal documents but you know there's abatement there's all of these terms that make it mimic a lease rather than like a general obligation bond obligation okay and I I heard you when you said this isn't a time to debate the use of the facility and I, I uh, I'm not gonna violate that but I got to tell you as a taxpayer I'm kind of stunned that you're this far along in buying something when you can't articulate what you're gonna do with it and as as they've explained tonight that that drives how you finance it so how you can make an intelligent decision about how to finance something you're gonna buy but you don't know how you're gonna use it, it, it's kind of amazing to me well we know we, 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 we go, go ahead. ahead please <laughs> clearly we we know we don't want to be have restrictive uh, uses so that we know we want flexibility we want options we want it to serve the community and we want to make significant reinvestment out there and we've got a history of 80 years of use and it's the first opportunity in 80 years we've had to acquire the land uh, we're not going to go too far afoul because we know what the zoning restrictions are um, there are also some uh, restrictions or some compromises made in the agreement with the county as to how far off current uses we can go um, without triggering 
uh, some shared revenue with the county and that was all part of the compromise so uh, what we don't want to get the reason we're not bringing the uses up at the front end of this um, is because having quite a bit of experience in this element with this community it would send us uh, to a point where we would lose the opportunity to get this property um, I think it's pretty safe to assume uh, the general if you talk to the general community it's public purpose open spaces is what that's looking for uh, we have a long history of what the revenues and expenses for this property are uh, the only thing making revenue on this property right now is the RV park um, that's pretty much subsidized everything else um, so we we feel very comfort comfortable and confident in the history of this facility to be able to move at this point um. Do you want me to go over the remaining schedule? Sure. So, okay. Um, the last slide. Yeah, sorry, did anyone else have any other questions? Oh, yes, sorry. please. Share with us your name and your address, should you so choose. <laughs> You're allowed to say that, actually. <laughs> you know, I figured. <laughs> um, I'm Margaret Dussel, and I live at 611 Washington, down at the old folks' new apartment down there. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the old folks. Um, I also work at the RV park, and I have for the last year, so I spent a couple months with uh, the association, and now I've spent the last 10 months with the county. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you and all of you for all this hard work, um, I used to manage a multi-million dollar business and, and I understand what goes into something like this. So I just want to say thank you, regardless of what everyone's freaked out about what's going to happen with the property. I realize you're not there yet. I look forward to that meeting and the discussion about the different aspects of the property. Um, but for now, there's been an awful lot that's gone into this and I've, I've watched it a little bit and quite interested as so I'm there. So, we're thrilled and uh, look forward to seeing you on February 19th. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyone else before I close public comment? All right, close public comment and you have s anything else to share? I um, just wanted to review the what's left in terms of the schedule for the financing. Okay. So again, we're meeting with S&P on the 21st. We anticipate getting the rating on December 2nd. Um, and bond insurance surety bids on December 3rd if we need them. We'll be able to report that back out. Um, we're going to come back with the full financing package um, to authorize uh, the issuance of the COPs and approve the form doc documents, which include all the legal documents as well as the offering document. And um, again, this is a little bit unique in terms of the timing um, of the closing on the property it needs to coincide with the closing of these certificates of participation, which we're right now planning for fe February 19th. Um, and then we're planning to sell the bonds themselves uh, the week of January 20th. All right. Any other questions relative to that? City Manager Kern, uh, understanding we're in due diligence as we speak. Um, and that's going remarkably. Um, can, remarkably in the sense that uh, there hasn't been anything that we weren't expecting. It is as ugly as we've expected. Um, Perhaps uglier. There you go. So when will we be uh, having so, so some? I'm, I'm pretty much done with what I think I needed to do. Um, okay. I did get the report um, over the weekend from Tom O'Neill. Uh, so if you'll indulge me for Absolutely. a couple of minutes. Um, yep. So, and this this the information you're about to present is in our staff report. That's correct? correct. So there's there's really three components to the property. I'll call it the event center. So that includes the buildings and the the great lawn area, the the real property components. There's the RV park, and then there's the speedway. Um, all of the buildings are extremely tired. And, and I use that word with some forbearance. Um, the Tubbs mm -hmm. building and the Butler building and the Snack Shack all need new roofs or significant attention to their roofs. Um, we had a company, a reputable company that we've used before, um, analyze the roofs. Uh, the estimated value to, to make those uh, betterments is um, about $560,000. The all of the ADA components of the property are non-compliant. 
So accessibility, restrooms, light switches, all of those things. When the county did their um, self-assessment and transition plan, the value of the corrective action in 2007 dollars uh, was just under $300,000. Escalating that just on a CPI basis to today's dollars is about $450,000. That doesn't take into consideration current cost of construction given the environment that we're in. And my guess is that it's probably closer to 600,000 to bring the full facility up to full compliance. Um, the RV park um, has issues associated with storm water in the winter time. And the bathrooms, again, are, are less than desirable from a, a rental perspective. Uh, they're non ADA compliant. I'm just putting a number for addressing some of that to be between three and five hundred thousand. Um, on the speedway, uh, there's been a recent, I'll, I guess I'll use the word hiccup, um, that's come to our attention. There is an individual who has reported to have made personal improvements to the to the racetrack that were not memorialized in any form of uh, an agreement either with the county or with the Fair Association. Those improvements include uh, the safety fencing around the track, the upgrades to some of the lighting, the sound system, scoreboard, and there's some um, black, I guess I'll call it screening that prevents mud from being thrown off of the track onto adjacent uh, buildings. The individual has um, requested through the county and the fair association that those items be returned to him or he be allowed to retrieve them. The value that I've heard for those improvements is something in the range of 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars. Should those improvements be retrieved by the individual that installed them, uh, it would generally render the racetrack unusable as a race facility as historically operated unless those improvements were um, replaced. So it's it's something that we're, we're still trying to vet through um, but has the potential to be um, a significant game changer in how the racetrack might be operated going forward. Or in that case valued and this is the county's situation they need to correct for prior to our possession. Correct. But I, I'm I'm not, I don't believe that that will be rectified fully within the next two or three weeks. So it, it's something that we'll have to, to struggle with. And, you know, on December 3rd will be potentially a, it's going to be a significant decision point for us. And we do have other considerations if it's not resolved by then, including the extension of the due diligence there, period. There would be, a, this would be an opportunity potentially to say until this is resolved to all party satisfactions, we need to extend this. And then, and then that would be something that the financing team would need to be aware of also. Okay. The, there's a caretaker residence. I've never been inside. My, my suspicions are that it's tired as well. Um, I have heard um, horror stories. I, on the internal plumbing on most of the property. When I say the internal plumbing, I mean the sewer plumbing. Um, the Butler building has backed up on occasion while it's being been in use. Um, my understanding is that the, the sewer collection system is antiquated, root intruded, and very, very flat. Um, I think the reason for that is is that they tried to do all of the um, utility improvements, I'll say behind the property line and, and not go out into the public street. So there's excessive runs on sewer lines without manholes and or proper cleanouts. Um, the report from Tom O'Neill basically looked at the property from a best management perspective on assets. So treating all of the improvements as assets, what would be a best management practice for um, ongoing investment to 
either maintain the properties in state of good repair or bring them up to a state of good repair. In his analysis, he looked, he, he provided three 10 year windows of expenditures. So years zero to 10, he has identified this is what you should invest in the property to bring it up to something that meets the standard of the community and that would not be um, an eyesore. For that first 10 year window, his, his estimate of investment is $6.8 million. For the second 10 year window of investment, um, his number is 3.3 .3 million. And for the last 10 years, it's 1.9 million. So over the next 30 years, assuming the improvements and the construction value that he's identified, we would, there'd be an, a potential exposure of something just, just shy of about $13 million. It does not include normal O&M or staffing to operate the facility. So it's as part of the certificates of participation, we've factored in the 7.7 .7 for acquisition. And then there's about 1.2, 1.3 of additional um, proceeds that are available for capital investment on the property. And part of my method of madness for that is that if if the buildings are going to be retained as um, assets and refurbished, then we, we seriously need to think about at least getting the roofs and, and the buildings weather tight. And that's gonna be that probably that first $1.2 million investment. So that basically will we buy- We're gonna do something with the, with the bathrooms or we'll get sued. It'll buy the new, it'll buy the roof. Um, I think for the RV park, um, and the restrooms in the buildings, you know, those are the areas where we would have to focus uh, expenditure. We also have to look at accessible path of travel and, and how those how those are addressed as well. So there is there's a lot of um, issues. Uh, we knew that they were there were issues there. Um, it's it's quantifying the magnitude of the issues that that is um, something that your council needs to know going forward. Mm -hmm. um, there are at least two leases on the property uh, for the cell towers. Uh, those spin off about $60,000 a year in revenue. There are two solar panels um, on the facility. One is on the Ag Pavilion and one is on the grandstands. Uh, those are owned. Those are um, real property attached to the property. There's no lease to them. But from everything that I could see, there's no um, net meter where the, the value of the electricity generated is is quantified and then gone it goes through pg e standard um, net metering um, process or protocol um, it basically just offs the the energy generated is just offset by what's used on the property uh, there are i want to say 10 electric meters on the property and three gas meters uh, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure just in that regard um, the the other issue that I'd like to have a little bit of a conversation on is just the go forward operations and management of the facility um, as the mayor indicated the RV park is the biggest money revenue generator depending on what year you look at their financials uh, gross gross receipts are something just north of uh, 500,000 with operating costs just south of 200,000 um, the other facilities all in have a net um, more expenditure than revenue of about 120 to 150,000 a year so the fair the rental of the um, buildings and then the operation of the speedway all of those have a negative cash flow of about 150,000 so in the I'm not well versed in um, operating an RV park and, and no one else on staff is 
it may be in the city's best interest to have some conversation with the individuals that are currently employed by the county and to see if they'd be interested in being part-time temporary um, individuals to help us run the facility uh, going forward um, one of the complaints that I believe all of you here on a frequent and regular basis is the county's not taking any reservations for any components of the property and the same thing is probably starting to happen with the RV park as well um, lastly contained in the sales agreement is a, a provision that any personal property or assets owned by the Napa County Fair Association are not part of the sale um, you saw the article in the paper a couple of weeks ago that they were looking to sell uh, their assets uh, they shared with me a the laundry list of everything that they have out there uh, I've gone through it uh, with staff uh, we've identified those pieces of um, asset that we feel would be useful and or necessary to manage the facility as a rental facility uh, going forward uh, there's three pages in your staff report that I've uh, included the valuation of those um, pieces of inventory are the fair boards valuation and not mine um, but if just using their raw numbers um, they've the things that I think we would want to consider acquiring has a valuation based on their numbers of about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars so we're we're sharing with you or I'm sharing with you a lot of a lot of information um, but it's things that I think I feel compelled to share with you because it's going to help you make an informed business decision in the next handful of weeks we don't necessarily need to make a determination on um, staffing levels but it's something that is fast approaching um, and then in that the fair association is looking to potentially market uh, those assets um, it may be incumbent upon us to see what kind of deal we can cut with them and with that I'm here for any questions you may have thank you very much um, just as a reminder during the very long negotiations we've had with the county on this we did take into consideration in the parameters for negotiating terms and conditions including price uh, we did take into consideration the decades of uh, lack of deferred maintenance or any maintenance but significant maintenance uh, done by the county uh, and I think the phrase we used is we didn't want to become house poor where we spent everything we had on the facility and not be able to make some of the necessary changes with that said um, and trying to go in wise eyes wide open um, these are uh, some of these expenses uh, potential expenses are significant to say the least so obviously all part of the decision process there um, and is not the price uh, anywhere near the price the county wanted per acre to begin with but um, again having to understand that there would be some expenses involved in bringing it to even a moderately uh, usable facility with that said any other council members questions I have a question for the finance team when I bought my house the lender wanted to see an appraisal on the value of the house does something like that happen on this property Thank you for the question um, so for for this transaction as we mentioned it's it's a lease so we do have to establish fair rental value and right now generally the market uses okay I'm gonna borrow if I'm gonna borrow nine million the assets that I'm leasing should have a value of, of at least nine million so we do look at um, the insured value as well as we can include the land value um, of both the fairgrounds and the fire station um, they also have to be run through uh, the rating agency seismic model so we fill out information for them to run through the seismic model but um, for this type of transaction there isn't a need for a formal appraisal okay if we were to decide uh, that the rehabilitation of these buildings is cost prohibitive and we just want to for lack of a better term bulldoze a few of them and start over again how would that affect the lease 
So the, the good news is that my understanding, the 225000 per acre, the purchase price is really purchasing the land and doesn't take into consideration any value of the structure. So, um, so we should be covered in that aspect in terms of having enough for fair rental value. Okay, and then if we wanted to, let's say using the scenario that we want to take down uh, the, the tiredest buildings out there um, uh, and build a new facility, um, how would, would, I guess we would come back and get additional financing then on top of what it is we're looking at right now? That, right, if and, you can't that's, fund... An that's possible, in other words, like if I was wanting to put a swimming pool in my backyard, I might go out and get a second on the house or a homeowner's equity line or something like that. So, it would, you know, I've got the first on the house and then there would be this... Is something like that available on... Yeah, so it's a little bit different because it's not used as collateral per se because nobody can act, bank can't take back, bond investors can't take the property. So when we're looking at value, it is really to for that fair rental value aspect of this type of financing. But yes, I mean, if you if you can't afford a, on a pay-go and you want to make, um, build a new facility and we want to use that same facility as part of the leased asset, then same thing here where you'd have to have use of that um, asset by the time you actually close on the bonds. Now, if you're going to get the money and you're, then you're going to construct it, then there's, you know, we can do capitalized interest. There's some things we'd have to do to make that piece of it happen. But yes, you can come back to the markets um, and, and, and borrow again. For In other words, needs. we're not stuck with the buildings that we have over Correct. there. Should the community make never, a decision right. that we want to Right, so if you improve it and it's worth more, then that's a good thing. It'll be valued even more. And what if another party, like a partner, came in and they built the building? So, for example, the Boys and Girls Club. We own the land. Uh, we partnered with the Boys and Girls Club. We gave them a long-term lease for hardly nothing, and they built a 10 or $12 million facility. Would they own the building or would the city own the building? It's ours after 55 years. And so this is a question, can you do it or? Does it uh, do affect the, the, the current? Is there, is there an issue with the financing and the, the bond regulations? Uh, and I was going to defer to Dave on whether, I mean, it doesn't affect the, the current <laughs> bond <laughs> issuance, um, but in terms of like what you're going to use it for and all, and all of that, that tax analysis and. Okay. But the, right now it's the, the least asset is the fairgrounds, basically the land piece it's of it. It's the land. Yeah. Okay. Any other council members before open to the public again? Yes. So Don. We yes. Thank you. We want to be compliant with the um, ADA requirements. Um, is it the case that um, that the city is obliged? You know, when this transaction, assuming it's consummated, are we obliged immediately to conform to ADA entirely before we uh, open it to general use, or? Or can the ADA requirements be met gradually? So it's an interesting question. Um, generally speaking, the Americans with Disability Act was made into law, I want to say, in like 1996. So there's a, a strong understanding that government agencies have had ample time to become compliant. Uh, when the law was written, it, it took a while for it to take hold. And in California, government agencies were required to develop a, a self-assessment plan and then an a, what they call the ADA transition plan. And that was, what are your deficiencies? And how do you plan on bringing your facilities into compliance? The county undertook that self-assessment and identification of what it's going to cost to, to fix in 2006 and 2007. But from all appearances and everything that I can see based on what the reports identified as deficiencies and what's there today, very little has been done to bring it into compliance. So you always 
any any entity, whether it be public or private, run the risk of an ADA challenge litigation. Um, what we would, what I would suggest we do is, for those properties that have the highest and most use, we we revisit the transition plan and come up with something that's relatively aggressive, especially for the high volume um, or high traffic areas, and and make some demonstrative process in, in gaining compliance. Some of the deficiencies are not going to be easy to fix, and and those are primarily associated with um, accessible path of travel. Uh, most paths of travel for ADA compliance require 48 inches. In many instances, especially in the restrooms at the RV park, the clearance is less than 40 inches. And it's a block building, so we're talking about saw cutting, jackhammering, you know, opening up those 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 wing walls around those doors. And then you get so that's getting into the facility, so that's your first challenge. And then once you're in, what are the deficiencies associated with the interior? And it may be at the end of the day that the value of doing all of those betterments to gain compliance is equal to or more than it would cost to tear it down and start all over. But if you're following under the ADA compliance orders, if, you're, if you have an identified plan and you're making good faith effort as a government agency to comply, as long as you show forward progress, you you have the ability to dem and can demonstrate that to the courts, they may tend to give you some forbearance, but you're s depending on the type of challenge and who's challenging you, you're you, still getting you, still, you still might be writing a check. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? All right, anyone in the public, any other questions? Yes, please. I know yet. <laughs> Thank you. Was there a phase one or a phase two conducted on the property? The, there was a phase one conducted. There was uh, subsoil contamination identified um, from this uh, above ground storage tank. Uh, looks like that's been remediated. Have they looked for underground storage tanks based on the history of the property? They did, but none were identified. Okay, and then I just have one suggestion. Um, I used to be an investment banker, know a little bit about bonds and things. It doesn't make sense to me based on the federal tax rate and the California tax rate for individuals, that there isn't that big a difference between a fully taxable bond and a fully non-taxable bond. And so what I would look at, <clears throat> in my area of expertise was really in multifamily housing, what we called low floaters, which were variable rate bonds, where you can buy some kind of an interest rate cap or hedge and an enhancement. And it just stuns me if you can go out and borrow on a home and get a 30-year loan as a non-credit person, right, at three and, three and three quarters, why the city with an A rating would have to play close to five just doesn't make any sense. Now, you're the expert in this area, and I'm not, but I would, I would push the edge of the envelope here a little bit and look at some alternatives on the structure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please. <clears throat> Nope. I was texting with uh, my coworker Monica Garibay, and she said you forgot to mention to you guys that right now um, we are only making reservations in the RV park through February 15th. Uh, we have a dummy um, scale in there for charges uh, that was put in, um, but we can't take any reservations for after that so we now have a binder of names and phone numbers so that we can call them I'd say fully 75 to 80 percent of those are regulars who come all the time uh, we also have everybody wanting to set up their groups for next year where they come and bring 20 RVs and all their buddies and so we have a lot that's on hold for when you guys are ready to go and we can get our fee schedule in open that up for you and then go from there but um, and I know the property is a mess but you have a huge opportunity with the RV park big opportunity to clean that up jack the rates a bit uh, people love it uh, they come here specifically to stay at that RV park uh, so you have a we hope you'll take that opportunity 
Thank you. It is one of the things we take into consideration, but not the driving decision. No. <laughs> and if I was a betting man, we'd be looking at the extension of the due diligence. So you may be able to extend that a little bit further. Yes, sir. Should you so choose, share with us your name and your address. Welcome back, sir. Uh, Jim Barnes, 1710 Michael Way. First of all, I'd like to commend all of you sitting up here on the council, and Mike especially, for a job really well done. It was a great presentation. This is a wonderful opportunity. I don't sense any hesitancy on the council or on staff about doing this, about buying this, and about making it work. But if there is, I would ask that you keep in mind the following. About 20 to 25 years ago, a similar council sat here, I don't know who was on it, and considered the purchase of Logvi, the Logvi property. Uh, as I've heard, and this is just what I've heard, the price was about $6 million, which in today's money is probably closer to 12. It took 20 years to do it, or 25 years to do it, but look what Logvi looks like today. We have a brand new boys and girls club. We have a beautiful swimming pool complex. We have a veterans memorial. And we have a great open space with softball and soccer. And just tonight, we talked about putting in more playground equipment, bocce ball, picnic area. Look what that council did 25 years ago and the results. You have the same opportunity here, a little tougher, a lot more money, but the political will, I believe, is here to do it. And I'm encouraging you to follow through with this, with this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Oliver addressed this council very early on in this, pre in, in this process, and he was one of the deciding <coughs> votes on whether or not to go or not go for Logue V. And he was told at the time they were crazy. And to your point, look where they are today. His uh, uninhibited statement to us was, just shut up and do it, something to that effect. He, I threw in the shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone else? All right, I'll close public comment. So, Mike, you need on this a couple of things. Ideally. <laughs> Continue. So term of the loan or the term of the certificate of participation 20 or 30 pause there consensus should we choose 30. to move forward with this are we good with 30 30 i want 30 30 okay you have consensus on 30 thank you taxable or tax exempt uh taxable, taxable. consensus tax taxable. taxable well this is easy thank you going too fast debt service threshold so the way that we have it structured right now the existing uh, 2007 note would run its course without any refinancing mm -hmm. it's approximately three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year on the 30-year taxable new debt annual debt is about 525 530 so you're just under a nine hundred thousand for annual debt service. There are, but that's only for the first how for many the years? First eight years. Thank you. Then the the two the three twenty five drops off, and then you're back to the five thirty plus or minus. My recommendation is that we do not refinance the O seven note and let it run its course. The option that you might want to consider would be to capitalize some one or the first or second year of interest uh, reducing your annual payment for the first two years to something in the range of six or seven hundred thousand but then the out year debt service would go up probably another sixty to eighty thousand a year my recommendation would be to just run the course don't try and capitalize any interest um, tough it out for the first couple of years until the new revenues come online I agree. And that is a well-informed recommendation based on your finance team's suggestions. Absolutely. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Does anyone on the finance team take pause with that? All right. Next question. Acquisition of furniture, fixtures, and equipment from the Fair Association. Um, as Can we hold off on that decision? Sure. They're, they're, I'll let them know that 
we've presented this to you, um, <coughs> but they are anxious to try and move forward with either cleaning house or. And I just mean like by the next meeting or something. Yeah. Or I, I'll, I'll have a conversation with them. They've been uh, accommodating um, mm -hmm. in modifying their uh, disposal uh, schedule, um, but I, if we're moving forward and the schedule remains the same, there's a lot of heavy lifting in removing some of that stuff that somebody's going to have to do. And I mean, they might want may want to just leave it where it is. Well, the, some of it we don't want. <laughs> Understood. Um, but there's, you know, it's like cleaning out the the back forty. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there. Was the was the Red Cross Hospital ever moved out of the Butler building? I know we had some ether that got found over there, but I don't know if the rest of the I, I, stuff. I, apparently, there's a storage area upstairs yeah. uh, that's non-accessible, so I couldn't tell. But it, they did say that a lot of the stuff that was there um, was they had to throw it out. Uh, so I, what's there, I don't know. And then the last. Um, is management of at least the RV park and, and reservations for the facility going forward and and how might we want to partner or coordinate with the existing um, staff out there and transitioning to a, a part-time contract for services um, operation of that facility so that part of it I think as it's been explained to me some um, folks that rent or rent the spaces if they're long-standing every year for the last 20 years they kind of want some certainty that they can hold their you know family reunion or whatever and you lose that business um, clientele it's hard to get them back so I, I don't want to my suggestion would be that we don't try and we don't Put ourselves in a situation where we're jeopardizing that long-term rental relationship with them but i also don't want to put us in a position where we de, de facto right. end up managing a property we don't own right um and that's and i know the county has and i would say this if they were in this room they've continued to shirk their responsibility in the hopes that we would pick up the slack and what that does is put us in a position where we're going to feel obliged to keep knocking these pins down and then be further into a potential quicksand than we need to be um, it is their responsibility it is their property um, we discussed this during the negotiation period that they are supposed to turn this over to us in reasonable form not just facilities but business wise um, and I think it's worth a revisit in our dialogue on that with that negotiation team uh, that they are not managing that element of their responsibility well at all. At this stage, if I would, and I hinted at it earlier, I don't see the due diligence and the closing date standing at this point as we sit here today. I see a potential and significant extension to that due diligence period when you look at alone the enormous complication presented to us and unnoted to us um, regarding the speedway um, that's a pretty significant change in circumstances <coughs> on a relatively significant portion of a parcel we're buying and I have zero interest as one of five in taking over a property with a dispute in the middle of it um, until that's vetted and I don't see them at the pace that they generally work I don't see that vetting by our closing date and certainly not going to be in a position to make a decision on the financing if we're going to watch this roll. Right. So as um, presented by um, the finance team, we're looking to price January, mid-January, and the due diligence period for the agreement is on or about December 20th, and that's basically the go-no-go. -go. Um, we are not... We currently do not have a scheduled second meeting in December, so the next and <coughs> last business decision would be December third, or um, or we have another or we meeting. have another meeting. Correct. I what mean, I would sorry. I, I think the county is going to clearly take the position with regards to the racetrack issue. It's your problem. You deal with it. We're not touching it. 
and uh, so I'm prepared to accept that um, but I think there's a chance to basically say we want to keep all of the assets their property that they're suggesting that they would sell it's to me it's just chump change uh, and it's something that serves the community and by us losing all the chairs all the tables and for the city to have to pay for these things which uh, I mean I think if we had all this appraised it would probably come in a quite a bit less I'm not sure if they had it appraised but this type of stuff is cents on the dollar I'm not concerned about that stuff but the racetrack improvements are the the big problem I know but I mean, I'm it's just, a significant issue it's a significant issue to me it's so significant that it's deal or no deal I don't think the county is gonna come back and issue any credits I don't think we're gonna negotiate a better price they're gonna say take it or leave it and as Jim Barnes just said we got to get the ball over the goal line and figure out a strategy on how to deal with that particular problem so that's on us I don't think we're gonna get there may be another agenda in there that we're not you know by the person that is wanting his equipment back there may be an agenda in there too I well yeah know. I don't I don't want to I mean, get into that gonna do with it I, you know, I don't want to yeah. get into that speculation but I, I feel strongly at the very least I would like consensus from this council to allow the city's negotiation team to go back to the county on this matter this uh, having done this hands-on for two years this is a significant oversight on their part that if this private property is removed it renders a facility un completely unusable and that's not what we agreed to on a price whether we choose to have racing or not is one thing for us to decide but for it to be decided that a significant portion of this property is now completely unusable um, I have to st I have stand very firm that that is a, a deal changer significantly so yeah I'm agreeing with you I think you ought to bring it back I think we ought to bring it back to the county because this is not the deal that we talked about we had we had talked about this racetrack as we understood it to be and it's not so if it's not, or at least we don't it may not be and and that's a big enough issue that I think we can say to the county this is not what we this is not what we had talked about so at least we, allow we, us the opportunity to <laughs> yeah we've got to talk about between this, this meeting and the next meeting have that conversation as, as far as the chairs and the tables and and all that that's actually owned by the fair association not the county that's a separate thing from the county yeah, yeah. and um, I don't know what role the fair association is going to have going for forward I know they want to continue the the fair and I, th I think that's a good thing everybody likes the fireworks and you know the 4th of July activity that goes along with that so um, uh, while I think there needs to be a different price on on all of that stuff there it also needs to be known by the fair association that if they're going to be holding activities in there uh, and need any of that stuff we're liable to have to rent that to them so I misunderstood they're not trying to sell I, th I thought this was trying to be sold there they they're going to try to yeah. sell that Okay, that's yeah, what, we're their lead okay. candidate, and they're giving us the opportunity to buy it. Yeah, I have no issue with that. My issue is the por portion of the racetrack that is in dispute no, I, between I, a private property you, owner but, and the county. But we do need tables and chairs and stuff mm -hmm. like that to operate the facility as it has been in the past. And they have expressed an interest in continuing with the fair and everything. And if we have to buy all that stuff from them, and they need any of it for their fair, eh, we may rent it. I think it's safe to assume that we could hold this off till the third with the fair <coughs> association buying their equipment. I'll let them know that we had the conversation and that we're still contemplating. And we're an interested party. Putting in an offer, blah, blah, blah. And then would the council be, is the council comfortable with us going back to the county to discuss the issue regarding yeah. the racetrack? I think, you, I think you ought to do that. Yeah. Okay. And we'll try to have that concluded by the next meeting yes Don um, it's it's relatively small compared to this issue but um, I don't like to see the um, RV park 
neglected. Um, and I am inclined to authorize the city manager to hire somebody part-time, if that's what's appropriate, to, to be able to uh, let them operate into the future on the optimistic uh, perspective that we do acquire this and want to keep the RV park operating. I don't think it would be a big expenditure. Um, and I, th I think it's important, am, am I understanding right, that, that you be able to continue and be able to... Um, the, the only concern there, Don, is we'd yeah. be taking reservations for a facility that's not ours. So right yes, now the county yes. is collecting revenue, right. which is what they're using to offset their expenses, which is the personnel that are operating it. Um, in our discussions, I have no problem going back to the county to say you need to continue to take reservations in good faith, as we've all discussed. Um, I just I, I don't know what kind of position that puts us in if we ta put an employee of ours in there okay. to take reservations on a facility that. Then will you bring that to the? You're in the negotiating team, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so can you bring that to the table as well? Tell them you know everybody wants the RV park to succeed. And yeah. it's, it's not a big money issue, I don't think, to keep it operating in the short no, it's term. Self, it's self-sustaining. Yeah. 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 They're collecting money, so they yeah. should be. <laughs> and, and for the city to you know, participate in that, I'm okay with that happening okay. rather than let the RV go down the drain. Okay, we'll bring that back for the December yeah. 3rd. Anything else? Thank you all very much. Um, with that said, we'll adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which is December 3rd at 6 p.m. Thank you all. Have a good evening.